This is Have You Met. My guest today is a planetary scientist and founder of the Mars Institute. He works with both NASA and SETI. We talked about his time as a meteorite hunter, the planets in our solar system and whether they might harbor life, the future of humanity on Mars, and subjects further afield such as Oumuamua, the James Webb Space Telescope, UFOs, and much more. Have you met Pascal Lee? Okay, so Pascal, tell me a bit more about your background. My background, um, I was uh, born in Hong Kong, which is one of the least Mars-like places on Earth. Um, and I wasn't doing too well in school. So uh, my parents uh, sent me to a Catholic boarding school in France at age eight. And from then on, I, I grew up in, in near Paris and in Paris, um, which uh, is probably at this point, the greatest city in the galaxy, but we can, we can revisit <laughs> that. Uh, and uh, I would go back to Hong Kong for the summers. And, and so I, I kept up with, you know, speaking Chinese as a little kid. Uh, but then I had to learn French when I went to, to Paris. Mm. Uh, and as I was growing up, I became really interested in, in space and astronomy. And I think the, the one book that really made me want to become a planetary scientist, somebody who studies planets, was uh, Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmic Connection. It's not his most well-known book. This was before he, he became well famous with, uh, with Cosmos. Uh, but it was a very uh, good book. It was sort of a more intimate journey of, of his um, upbringing and becoming a planetary scientist. And I remember his, his describing how he, he would one day, you know, he was one day driving to JPL in Pasadena um, looking forward to seeing the, the first images of the surface of Mars taken from mm -hmm. the Viking one lander. And I'm sort of trying to imagine the thrill that must have been to, to sort of uh, experience that. But anyway, uh, that's the book that really made me want to become a, a planetary scientist. And I eventually ended up meeting him, but we can talk about that later. Uh, so uh, uh, that was growing up in France. And then after France, I mean, after high school, I went to university in Paris. I studied geology, geophysics, physics, first geology and geophysics. And I, I think I got into geology and geophysics because of all the scientific disciplines, it came with a lifestyle that I uh, was really attracted to. I wanted to spend a lot of time in the field, uh, mm. visiting our planet, uh, you know, if you... I love all fields of science, but geology had the lifestyle that's sort of, uh, I found very attractive. Yeah. Uh, and then of, of course there was also the prospect of maybe one day going to the moon and Mars and being able to do something useful there. So, so, so geology was just a, you know, a good, a good, good field. Uh, and then uh, in the process at the time in France, they still had a, a draft so I had to do a year of national service. And so I applied three years of, ahead of time to go to Antarctica. Mm. And it was a long shot, but, for, and I didn't know anybody. <laughs> Wasn't any uh, sort of favoritism or anything. I didn't know anybody, but I, I applied to go to Antarctica. And uh, lucky, luckily enough, I, I got the, uh, the one slot that they offer to a uh, uh, soldier geologist oh, uh, yeah. each year to go spend yeah. a year in Antarctica. And so, so that was me three years later. And so I went there for, I spent an entire year at the French base uh, and also on the ice cap on, on some road trips, but, but uh, I spent an entire year in Antarctica at that time. And that was a life changing experience for me because I mean, I, I was so interested in going because I realized that, you know, it would be a, well, a very special experience, of course, but, but it would be a bit like going to Mars. It'd be like a bit like being on Mars, you know, in a place where you're isolated, where you, you're living with us with a small crew, um, a place, to, you know, that would be otherworldly by Hong Kong and Paris standards. Mm. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, sure enough, it lived up to that expectation. It was just an incredible journey. So forever in my life, there will be before Antarctica and after. Uh, right. It was it was a life changing experience, 
And um, in what way? In what way was it so life changing? Well, you know, I was a city kid, so yeah. for me it was life changing. I was a city kid. This was the first time I was really in in deep contact with with the wilderness. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about parks and you know places where you can go camping. I'm talking about a place where you know you're really uh, up against the the brutal nature uh, of the earth in its you know in its raw uh, mm. state, and uh, you know it, it was just very exciting. I mean, you could you could walk. The base was on an island, but of course, in the winter, it, the, the surrounding sea and ocean freezes over. So you can now walk from island to island. And as you do that, you come across colonies of penguins and uh, seal holes with seals laying around, breathing, you know, resting. Uh, I, I was I, it was really the first time I was in direct contact with nature, you know, with with no barriers between me and, you know, mammals and birds. And uh, it was just an incredible thing. So yeah. on top of that, of course, I was already interested in astronomy and space. Uh, on top of that, well, the geology was super interesting. The French base happened to be the, happens to be the, the station that's near the south magnetic pole of the Earth. Uh, and that actually was part of my job. I was measuring variations of the Earth's magnetic field right there at that station. Um, but uh, it's also a, an astronomy wonderland. You, the sky is so clean, so clear, mm. uh, and, and then cold, and therefore very stable. Uh, and you are talking about the southern sky now, which I had never seen before. Um, you know, uh, we, we can see from the southern hemisphere the center of our own galaxy, which we cannot see from, from the northern hemisphere, at least not as far north as where we are. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so by, by being able to see the center of the galaxy, I mean, that's a wowing moment because you can really see the, you know, this bright band of light that the galaxy is uh, much better than elsewhere. But on top of that, the, you know, the, the clouds of dust that are blocking partly the, the light from the center of our galaxy. So it was just a magnificent thing, magnif magnificent thing. Uh, and then, of course, there's also uh, the southern lights, which of course exist in the north as well, the aurora borealis in the north the aurora australis in the south. Mm. Southern lights were incredible. It's like seeing the, 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 the lines of the Earth's magnetic field, you know, materialize before you. Wow. Is it the same color as the aurora borealis? It, it is the same color, and it comes in, in two tones. The, you know, the, there are shades of red and shades of green, and one is um, uh, field particles that are streaming along the magnetic field hitting nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere, and the other lines are, the other color is, is oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So, so those two glow in different, different colors. Um, yeah, it was just an incredible... Uh, experience and then of course the the friendship with with people and the the intensity of sort of being cooped up and living with the, the same faces for an entire year i mean i had been used to that a little bit from boarding school so that in itself i, sh I think prepared me well for for that experience but uh you know you nobody that you initially care for is around you you know you you sort of make friends there and then you you sort of live with them it's just a very, very uh, special uh, experience. Um, but it's there that a few things that are, you know, particularly interesting happened to me. First of all, I, I went on a few inland road trips and those gave me a real taste. And we're talking about driving vehicles that are on tracks. Okay. Like, you know, in fact, they were D-Day, they were recycled D-Day uh, weasels, uh, which are these, you know, transport vehicles that float as well, mm -hmm. uh, but are on tracks and can allow you to just climb on shore and, uh, yeah. you know, get onto the continent. So, so we went on a long road trip, hundred kilometers inland uh, on, on some of these weasels. Uh, so that gave me a real taste for these long road trips in the complete wilderness. And that apparently will, will have an effect on me later in life. I can talk about that story later, but the other thing is uh, it, um, uh, I also had my first ever helicopter flight. And that was an incredible experience for me because I was into flying already. I, I, you know, as a, as a teenager, I learned to fly gliders in France and I, I was really into flying, but you know, gliders is what you can afford. 
uh, helicopters is not something I could afford, but mm. all wintering personnel were offered a one hour helicopter flight before we started our winter, just to fly around the surrounding and be given a, a nice farewell gift. And I remember being lucky to have the front seat on the helicopter. It was a, you know, French Alouette and we took off from base vertically which is so disconcerting when you are <laughs> when you fly airplanes normally uh so i had my very first helicopter flight in antarctica and we we flew out uh, over the ocean and you know here comes an iceberg and we land on it and as we land on it you know the penguins are jumping off to the sides mm -hmm. into the water so it wasn't a very friendly thing to do for the penguin that it was just an incredible wonder to be able to just land on an iceberg. And so I promised myself after uh, this experience that I would, I would one day learn to fly helicopters uh, and you know, forget about airplanes. <laughs> helicopters <laughs> helicopters yeah. are like the lunar modules of the earth. You know, you, you can, you pick a crater and you land, that's it. You don't need a runway. You don't, you don't, <laughs> you generally don't even have to ask for permission. <laughs> uh, so, so that's that's how wonderful they are, and um, you know, so that that's what gave me the first taste for vertical flight, and I, you know, of course, while I was in Antarctica, I was being paid, and meanwhile, I, I couldn't spend anything because there's nothing to to buy there, yeah, other than postage stamps. Uh, so uh, I, I saved up quite a bit, and so after you know, a few years later, I, I sort of. I paid for my own training in helicopters and became a, a commercial pilot and a flight instructor on helicopters. Did you work as a commercial pilot for a while or did you just get become qualified? I, I did a few side jobs. Like I flew aerial photographers around. I was building my own time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was a symbiotic relationship. They, they, they were just paying for my flying time, but not my actual personal time. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't a job for me, but I was needing to build up hours so so I could do that. So the photographers were doing aerial photography and I was I was flying. But I was I was doing that in New York, New York City. Uh, you know, so that was pretty incredible flying. At the time the Twin Towers were still there. And you know, you could fly over Manhattan with your own helicopter. It was I didn't have my own helicopter, but you know, one could uh, yeah. you know, do all kinds of flying at the time still. Now it's far more restricted. Yeah. Do you still fly now? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. When I can. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So when you can, you you've got like, what is it? A helicopter? Is you share a helicopter? Well, you, with you, go, you know, you you sign up with their with an air club, a flying mm. club, and you you can rent the helicopter, and you know, it's 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 still not really affordable, but it's yeah, it's it's marginally so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, it's not a bad way to spend your free time. No, then you don't have to start fly for very long. I mean, even a 15, 20 minute flight is, is, you know, is a good way to keep current and, and it's, it's, you know, it's quite reasonable. I mean, you can spend the money on far more useless things. <laughs> and a bit exhilarating, I guess, as well. You get it a bit of a kick for that, a little 15 yeah. minutes of uh, flying yourself around. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Cool. So back back onto the the island. Then, how did you go from there to becoming a planetary scientist? Was that a, a long so, gap, or was that pretty direct? Well, yeah. So, so it, I don't I don't know how direct that was, but somewhere along the way, um, uh, as I was sailing down to Antarctica, and, well, actually flying and then sailing, I, I stopped in Singapore, and I posted. I mailed my my one application for graduate school in the United States. I wanted to become a planetary scientist. I wanted to to be closer to NASA. You know, the United States is where the space program was. It was either that or the Soviet Union. So I chose the United States. And on my way to Antarctica, I posted this one application to graduate school to go to Cornell because it's where Carl Sagan was, but also where I had found somebody who potentially could be a really good advisor for me. So I actually had specifically requested that advisor, Joe Baverka. He was a, a postdoc, a postdoctoral student, if you will, of, of Carl Sagan's, but he was by then a, a professor himself at Cornell as well. And I, I wanted to work with Joe Baverka, who was a geologist. Carl Sagan was more of a, a planetary chemist. Uh, Joe Baverka was, was um, a camera guy and also a, a, a geologist. So anyway, I, I 
posted this hopeless application to graduate school. And sometime in the middle of my winter in Antarctica, I got this uh, telex telling me that I was accepted and that I could start graduate school right after I was done with Antarctica. So, so after the ice, I went to more ice in Ithaca, New York, <laughs> ice and snow. For those of you who know what the climate is like in upstate New York, that's where Cornell is. Uh, and I had a few wonderful years there, uh, getting my doctorate, becoming a, a real planetary scientist. And I ended up being uh, Carl Sagan's last TA, uh, his last teaching assistant. He oh, really? Taught, yeah, he taught a co course that, uh, that last year he taught on uh, science writing. Mm. And uh, I think something like 3,000 students at Cornell applied to be part of that class. And, you know, it was only admitting 25. So I got to know Carl pretty well by just screening the students together. Um, but after that, we, you know, it was a writing class. So there were essays to grade, you know, once every two weeks. And I ended up doing that in Carl Sagan's living room on Saturday afternoons, just, you know, one-on-one -on -one wow. with him going through papers. Yeah. Uh, so that was really a special experience. And, you know, I mean, I can tell stories about that, but uh, what, one of the things I remember is he, he had a, a rep, replica of the Rosetta Stone in his living room. So for those of you who don't know, the Rosetta Stone is this incredible slab of rock that was found in Egypt that had the same story uh, of some king, I think, but the same story written in three different languages at the time. And one of those three languages was hieroglyphics. And this was before anybody could understand what well, anybody in relatively modern times understood what hieroglyphics meant. But by having the same text written in three languages, the two others being known, we were finally able, uh, Champollion and, and a few others, were finally able to decipher uh, hieroglyphics, you know, what the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian writings uh, meant and were about. Uh, so it was a very important uh, discovery, that Rosetta Stone and it was discovered by a soldier of Napoleon when he was, when Napoleon was off in Egypt, but it never made it back to France. The British Navy defeated Napoleon and, you know, eventually in Egypt and grabbed the Rosetta Stone. And that's how it ended up in the British Museum where it still sits today. Okay, so, but the Rosetta Stone is something that uh, Carl made a replica of, a full-scale replica of for the Cosmos TV series. Uh, and there's a sequence that he films in Egypt with his replica with him to explain the significance of that, of that rock. And um, anyway, uh, he was explaining to me that when I was expressing awe at the replica that was sitting in his living room, he, he, he told me that I wouldn't believe the, the trouble that he had to go through to take that thing back out of Egypt again, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. In, in, in reference to the regrets the Egyptians have of having lost the first real one uh, yeah. to the British Museum. Uh, wow. Uh, so anyway, I thought that was funny. Yeah. But eventually, he apparently, they let him out of Egypt with a <laughs> replica. With the stone. <laughs> with the stone. And it was now yeah. in the living room. Yeah, so anyway... Yeah. It was just really good times, uh, very exciting times. And um, my American experience was really an American dream. I mean, I, I arrived at, uh, in Ithaca and at Cornell and in, on something like August 15th of 1989. And two weeks later was the flyby by Voyager 2 of Neptune. And Voyager 2 is the spacecraft that I had that had followed me all along my my upbringing almost. I mean, I had I remember it when it was being planned, and then it eventually launched in 1979, and then it uh, 77 actually, and then it made it to Jupiter and Saturn and in 8081. Uh, and next thing you know, it was flying by Uranus in for the first time in 1986. Uh, uh, and then eventually in 1989, it, it got to Neptune. So I, you know, I was in high school when it was on its way to Jupiter. Uh, and here I was now at Cornell for the final flyby of a giant planet in our solar system. So it was, 
it was sort of just amazing to be joining that mission for its final, um, you know, um, show. And I, I show up at Cornell and I meet my advisor, Joe Viverka. And he said, well, don't, don't, uh, don't unpack yet. Uh, would you like to go to JPL for the Voyager to uh, fly by? So I was really <laughs> talk yeah. about uh, what do they call that? Uh, uh, um, imposter syndrome. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> you know, where you don't feel yeah. adequate. Uh, yeah. You know, who am I? What am I doing here? So anyway, uh, Joe said, no, don't unpack. We're, we're going to send you then to, to, to Pasadena for the next uh, several weeks to work with us for the Voyager 2 flyby. So uh, I'm, I'm explaining that because it, it was really quite incredible. Uh, that's sort of the doors that opened uh, by, yeah. by coming to America and being part of the space program. Uh, and I hadn't done anything yet. I was just starting as a student. <laughs> Uh, so I hadn't even performed as a student, you know, uh, but yeah. anyway, um, so that Amazing was an incredible thing. So, and my focus was actually not so much Neptune itself, but the flyby of its large moon Triton with, which had a solid surface where you could do actually geology on. And, um, you know, I, I remember being in awe when we saw, we were the first human beings to see, uh, images of, of Triton. How does it look? It looked right. like Is an icy rocky, ball, icy? Yeah. icy ball, a bit like Pluto actually eventually looked like, although Pluto looks far more complex, but um, Triton was, was an icy ball, but with different textures of ice at its surface and, uh, you know, clearly signs that there were, there were past, there was past activity that might have involved uh, slushier ice uh, at some, at some phase. There were also uh, fountains or geysers of, of dirty ice spewing up into the atmosphere of Triton, which has a very thin haze of, of, of an atmosphere. Uh, so, yeah, and, you know, this is a world that's out there. This is not science fiction. This is a place, you know. Yeah. We, we, we sort of saw it as a place for the first time, as opposed to it being just a speck of light. Um, and... That was the moment it got you, was it? It was you were in for life. Yeah, I, I was. Well, if you at that ready. point, I, I, I said, no, you're going to have to drag me back now to Cornell or go back to class <laughs> or school. But yes, yeah. th that really did it. Um, wow. Yeah, where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we go into when you started getting paid for it. So actually when you became a planetary scientist yeah, well, and and I guess I, what your job entails as well, like what it, what it, the day to day. I started getting paid for doing this as soon as I got to graduate school. That is sort of another aspect of the American dream. And I think people should know about this because it's still true. If you, if you go for, you know, a PhD in astronomy uh, in America, at least, you know, you, uh, your, your university will find a way to, to pay for, for that for you. And so mm -hmm. as much as undergraduate studies are often pretty expensive uh, when it comes to graduate school in some fields, especially fundamental science like like astronomy uh you you will get you know there are plenty of programs that will cover your studies uh it's expected that you know you won't be able to earn your way back to to pay for it it's not like if you go to you know if you study medicine <clears throat> you get a bank loan if you study engineering you, you you might need a bank loan to sort of pay for your studies if you study astronomy nobody's expecting you to make a living <laughs> I guess, and yeah. so, so you you get you get a fellowship or or or, or bust. Yeah, um, yeah. You're not going to get a bank loan, for sure, mm. to get a PhD in astronomy. Wow. Uh, so you got a scholarship. For so we got I got a fellowship, but just like every everybody else in the department who was a student there, and and so at that point, not only were my studies covered, but I was I was given a paycheck, you know, to, to you know for my living expenses. Uh, nice. Exactly, because That's people wouldn't expect you to have time to 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 work as a barista either. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's very cool. That it is yeah, very cool. Nice. And again, I, I credit that to the to the American dream. It's sort of uh, a real understanding of what it takes to to uh, to sort of nurture uh, students and and build expertise in, in any field. You know, it's, mm. it's sort of this sense that. Uh, you know, we should invest where, where it's going to help really. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that was, that was, 
becoming a planetary scientist. Now, as soon as I uh, was, a, so first of all, I wanted to do a thesis on Mars. Mars was why, why I was, you know, Mars was the place I was so interested in. And unfortunately, there was no new data on Mars and there hadn't been. And there was an upcoming mission called Mars Observer. My advisor was on it. We, he was a member of the camera team. I became an associate of the camera team. And that was going to be the meat for my thesis. So the spacecraft, uh, I, I saw it launch. It, it got to Mars in a year. And during that year, I spent a year uh, programming the camera uh, of that spacecraft, making it ready to take pictures of Mars and things that we, that we wanted to look at. And uh, it gets to Mars and just, in, in fact, two weeks before it got to Mars, I moved to San Diego in California to be closer to the headquarters of the camera team. And I, I thought I had it really made now because I was going to get a degree from Cornell, uh, but without having to live with the weather of Cornell, I was going to be in San Diego in California, <laughs> 3,000 miles away from my advisor as well. But, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the day of orbit insertion, when the spacecraft had to fire up its retro rockets to slow down and get captured by Mars in orbit around Mars, uh, it, it started spinning widely and it, it didn't get captured by Mars. It just flew past Mars. Mm. And the postmortem report basically uh, concluded that the, the two fuels that need to mix in the reaction chamber of the rocket and ignite spontaneously actually met upstream somehow. There was a leak, uh, you know, and br the two fuels sort of bridged over some plumbing uh, and when the fuels were released, basically they contacted and then the exothermic reaction took place upstream of the rocket uh, engine. So that's not good. Yeah. Uh, and that essentially sent the, the spacecraft spinning and there was not enough uh, fuel then left for the retro rocket burn to be done properly. And so the thing just mm. flew past Mars as a spinning piece of junk which was a real letdown. I mean, not only for all the people who, not only for me, but for the whole team that had worked on this for years. I mean, that was really yeah. a big loss. And people often don't realize how how distressing this is for-, for, for I'm imagining it right now. Like, yeah, you spend years and, and you you're probably spend every, every, on every hour you've got, you're putting your time into that, your, your free time, you're thinking about it, you're excited about it. And then yeah, all of a sudden I, it's just gone. And I, I wasn't part of that. Uh, people who had spent years working on mm. this. I mean, I just came in at the last minute programming the camera for, for a few mm. months, you know, before, before the, the, the mission. So I was getting the, the sweet part of it. And I was just, I was just getting the icing on the cake, but th those who made the cake, yeah, really lost a lot. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I went back to Ithaca, New York, did a thesis on asteroids, which was sort of my second love asteroids, impact craters. Cool. Uh, in the process my advisor actually let me go to Antarctica, uh, collect meteorites, with, which was an invitation from another team. And I, I was really excited by that. They, they wanted somebody who was experienced with Antarctica to join them. And since I had that experience, I, I sort of qualified. And, and that was another super experience. So now this was with the U.S. program. I went to McMurdo, flew uh, to along the Transantarctic range. In fact, we were looking for the blue ice for meteorites in the blue ice fields that are closest to the south pole uh of of, of the earth and mm -hmm. so i never went to the south pole itself but we were in the blue ice fields you know uh, along the sides of the mountains nearest the south pole again an incredible experience we were eight weeks roaming the ice on snowmobiles looking for black rocks sitting on the ice and wow. the majority of them are meteorites <laughs> yeah really the majority yeah well in some places the majority is actually earth rocks but in other places the majority are, are meteorites yeah uh and that is just an incredible thing so you stop by something that okay this came from the asteroid belt and then a little further wow this rock came from the moon and a little how'd further, you tell just by looking at it what is the defining often you can tell uh often just by looking at it you really cannot but if a piece of it because the outside of a meteorite is usually burnt up and has a bit of a, a fusion crust it's called 
But if if there's a break in it, if um, if there's a, a fresh rock, fresh part of the rock that's exposed, you can then tell from the texture, the color, if it's likely to be just a regular uh, asteroid material or whether it might even be a Martian meteorite, if it looks like, you know, lava or vul- a volcanic rock, or if it looks like a moon rock, uh, you know, which, which are often all broken up and re-welded together. So a moon rock typically looks like, you know, um, concrete that is very coarse, you know. Uh, wow. So anyway, an amazing experience. And, and so you're, you're essentially visiting other worlds of the solar system by just driving around in this surreal place, like an ice field in Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. I'm working on a book, which I, you know, it's taking years to hatch, but uh, it's called my life on Mars adventures of a planetary scientist on planet earth. And that's the working title. It probably changed by the time it comes out, but uh, I, I want to tell these stories because they, they are really part of the, the, you know, modern experience of being a planetary scientist. You know, you, you can really roam the planet and, and, and really experience very special things. Yeah. So what else? Uh, so I went back to Cornell, did a thesis on asteroids in the end. And I was lucky because my advisor, who was on the camera team of pretty much every spacecraft in the solar system, uh, gave me the option of, of working on data from another camera. And so... Uh, uh, Galileo a spacecraft was on its way to Jupiter, but in the process was going to do two asteroid flybys. And this was, this was going to be the first time that an asteroid would be seen up close, where you would actually, uh, saying that it's the first time you resolve it wouldn't be true because we, we actually could see asteroids resolved as in we could see their shape from radar, for example, from Earth already. But this was the first time we were actually going to see rocks and craters and features at the surface of an asteroid in in sort of visible imaging. And Galileo was going to do that. It was going to fly very close to 951 Gaspra and a year later, so to fly by 243 Ida. And asteroids are, there are zillions of them out there. But like I said, these were the two first that were ever seen up close for the first time. And uh, as far as you know, funny experiences. My my advisor, who was on the imaging team again, um, <clears throat> didn't want to deal with the task of naming the craters, so he 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 dumped that on me. He said, "Okay, Pascal, uh, this asteroid is named after Gaspar, which is a a resort in Crimea, uh, and therefore <clears throat> the International Astronomical Union has decided that all craters on on Gaspar shall be named after resorts around the world." hot springs resorts. So have a field day. <laughs> uh, so I ended up naming every little crater on Gaspra <laughs> after Calistoga Springs, uh, you know, some, some resort somewhere. There was Aix-les-Bains in, you know, from, from France. There was, uh, uh, I mean, many others that I, you know, don't remember even, but, uh, that's sort of another surreal moment of being a planetary scientist, you know, yeah. student, is to get this kind of grunt work. Uh, Where is that asteroid now? It's still minding its own business going around the sun, you know, like many others. It, it uh, probably yeah. will never be seen again because it wasn't that interesting. Uh, but uh, it's a typical S-type asteroid. So, you know, it's, it's made of very primitive solar system material, but not that primitive. It's evolved a little bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Half of it is is uh, is mapped and named. The other half is <laughs> nice. <laughs> somebody else's job. Yeah. Uh, cool. and then we we moved on to Ida. Ida was a double turned out to have a moon, a moonlit. So it had a two hundred meter wide moon. I mean, the Eiffel Tower is three hundred meters tall. This thing, this thing has a moon that was about uh, actually. Now that I think about it, it was more like two kilometers in size. Yeah, it was two kilometers in size. It was a very small moon. Uh, going around around Ida, around an asteroid, around, around an, asteroid. an asteroid, yeah. And so yeah. that, in hindsight, is 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 not that unusual. We now know of asteroid systems that are that are binaries, so, so where there are two bodies that are just you know going around each other. And generally, the way it's believed they form is is following an impact. They they sort of break up, but then still remain um, 
gravitationally bound. Uh, and so, you know, through the interaction of the impact, if it, if it's powerful, but yet slow enough, you, you can, you can end up with two bodies that are, you know, in orbit around each other. Mm. Uh, otherwise it's just a flyby and a capture. That's not going to work because you generally speaking, you, you fly by each other very, very quickly. And of course, asteroids belts don't look at all like how they're depicted in star Wars or, or any, any movie, the, the average distance, you know, let's say you're standing on a one kilometer size asteroid. Well, the average distance between you and the next one kilometer size asteroid out there is about a million kilometers. Mm. Okay. So, so there's really a lot of space in the asteroid belt and collisions yeah. aren't that frequent. You can dodge them. Just you can about. dodge them. <laughs> plenty of room to dodge them. In fact, we, we've flown through them with spacecraft often, you know, worrying about whether or not we're going to hit an asteroid. And it's like, chances are, are zilch, uh, wow. really, uh, you know, to, to hit anything. Now, you might hit a higher, at a higher rate, some smaller particles, dust that's sort of permeating the whole asteroid belt uh, from multiple past collisions, you know, so, so, but otherwise, between asteroids, but, but otherwise, it's a very, it's a wide open space, an asteroid belt, okay? Interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, and essentially it's because if you were as compact as, as portrayed in star Wars, collisions would be too frequent. You would end up with a ring of dust. Uh, you know, you would never end up with a, a ring as densely packed with so many big chunks, unless it was immediately following the breakup of something really big. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if that were the case and it was still hanging around, okay, that might be a circumstance, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so Ida turned out to be also super interesting. And uh, so here I was, you know, mapping the geology of Ida, but also of its little moon, which, you know, <laughs> they're both made of rock. Uh, that's pretty yeah. much it. So, nice. <laughs> so, but that, so here, you know, but then of course my thesis was coming to an end and I had to look for what I would do next. Um, and my eyes, my, my sights were set on, first of all, going back to Mars. Uh, but second, <clears throat> on doing more field work in polar regions, but this time going to the north polar regions of the Earth. As I was toiling away, writing my thesis, uh, uh, I remember looking up at this map that I had on the wall uh, of the impact craters that we knew of on the Earth. Now, you know, the Earth has had impact craters all over the place, just like the moon does uh, at some stage in its past. But the earth is such a dynamic planet with plate tectonics going on that most of, most of these impact craters have been erased by the, the active geology of the earth. Uh, nevertheless, there, there are about 200 or so impact craters that are still easily recognizable on the surface of the earth. And we, we know them pretty much all of them now. We're still finding a few that, that sort of escape the inventory, but they tend to be smaller or really old and, and not easy to recognize unless you actually have rock samples to, to back up your, your interpretation that there are craters. But the ones that sort of look like a nice crater that you could still recognize, I mean, there's about 200 of them. And one of them on that map was really drawing my attention because it was very near the North Pole of the Earth. In fact, it was the highest latitude impact crater known on land on Earth. There's one that's off the coast of Norway on the ocean floor, but that's not a good Mars analog. Uh, this one was sitting on uh, Devon Island in the high Arctic of North America. Uh, and it was called Houghton Crater, H-A-U-G-H-T-O-N, Houghton Crater. And Houghton Crater was 20 kilometers across. So that's really big. Uh, Meteor Crater in Arizona that most people are familiar with uh, is about 1.2 kilometers in diameter. This thing is 20 kilometers in diameter. Okay, so very mm -hmm. big. And it's sitting on Devon Island, which is uh, the largest uninhabited island on Earth. And in a setting that's a polar desert, it's cold and dry. Yeah. Uh, and that's that makes that does everything about preserving this crater and and why this landscape that we have on Devon Island looks so much like Mars, cold and dry. Uh, most of Siberia is cold and wet, northern Siberia. Most of 
Alaska is cold and wet. That's why you have tundra. You don't have really polar desert. Tundra is still grassy. Uh, you know, if you're a mammoth, you might still enjoy tundra. Uh, if you're a mammoth, you will not enjoy polar desert because now almost nothing is growing and you are in a rocky, you know, barren, cold place. Uh, so there aren't that many places on earth that qualify as a polar desert. Uh, there's the Eastern High Arctic, which is where Devon Island is. There's also the dry valleys of Antarctica and, and of course, Antarctica itself, but that's mostly ice covered. That's cold and dry. Uh, dry meaning not much liquid water is, is available at any point yeah. during the year. Uh, and then, of course, you have the summits of the highest altitude mountains, uh, of the highest mountains. Uh, that's also, you know, you might describe that as a polar desert, okay, as a cold desert. Uh, but in any case, uh, there aren't that many places on Earth that meet that standard of being really cold and dry, like Mars is. And of course, no place on Earth is as cold or as dry as Mars is, but, but you know, being the, a step in the right direction. And so Devon Island had all these attributes. It had the cold, the dry, and then a large impact crater sitting there, which had been studied, but not from a, let's compare it to Mars perspective. Uh, it was studied as, a, as an Earth impact crater. Yeah. Um, and so, so as I was toiling away finishing my thesis on asteroids, I uh, was imagining that my next big project would be to uh, propose to NASA that we should go to Devon Island, visit Houghton Crater, and look at how we might, what might be similar there to Mars and what might not. The first reaction was it was declined. Said, nah, uh, unlikely to be similar to Mars. Of course, there were a bunch of reasons, which were not good reasons, but it was declined. And this is a true story. I reproposed, reproposed exactly the same thing. But by then, the management had changed. And the second time, the reviews were wow, great project, funded three years. Awesome. Okay. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you did it. So much for peer review. Yeah. So, still, yeah. Well, so that's it. So I graduated. I, I moved to NASA in California, uh, NASA Ames. Uh, that was an incredible, I mean, first of all, when you're done with your thesis at, at Cornell and Ithaca, New York, the only direction you want to move in is really west and south. Somewhere so warmer. Yeah. somewhere warmer and nicer. So I moved to <laughs> California. That qualified. But next thing you know, I was up in the Arctic in a place that was worse than Ithaca. Uh, so, but nevertheless, NASA Ames became the, uh, the my new hub. Uh, I met uh, an incredible scientist there, Chris McKay, who uh, really believed in this project and, and somehow was, was uh, very welcoming uh, to, to, to me. And so, uh, Thanks to Chris, we were able to pull off a, a fuel season like within two months of my arriving there. Uh, and Chris didn't get a chance to go, but I, I went up to Devon Island with with three other people, uh, and uh, we we just had an incredible, you know, uh, experience up there. We we landed on Devon Island, and the place looked just like Mars. I mean, the the landscape that we saw flying in. There were, it wasn't just a crater, it was canyons, valley networks, uh, gullies. It, it was Mars. It's as if we had actually never gone to Mars. And of course, this is going to feed internet fodder on the fact that NASA is faking Mars. But, but flying over Devon Island, it's as if we actually never gone, went to Mars and it was filmed there. Okay. But uh, of course, we have been to Mars. In fact, on your YouTube, right, you put some videos, I think, of showing the similarities, right, of some I, Martian I put, landscapes. That's right. I, and I have Earth. a few uh, YouTube. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, I, I have a few short clips showing some similarities between the Earth and Mars and some, yeah. some from Devon Island. But, but I'll yeah, make sure we link some of them somewhere. I'll just say if anybody listening or watching. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but yeah, this is it. it. It was Mars on Earth. It was Mars on Earth. So 
you know, even before we landed, we knew that, okay, we're going to have to come back to this place because we hadn't planned to see all this that we were seeing when we flew in. Uh, we got to go back to every one of these canyons and understand how they formed. Uh, and that's not to say that they formed the same way as they would have on Mars. It's just to, to say that, wow, this place really looks strangely like Mars and in under, under very different angles. Okay. In other words, well, it's one thing to have one type of feature look alike and, and be similar to Mars. But here we had really this, this incredible combination of, of, of surface features that, that had nothing to do with one another a, a priori. And yet the whole package was, was making sense. They were all there together in the same setting for a reason. And yeah, so that, that, was, that was the first arrival on Devon Island. Uh, that was going to be uh, a big life change for me too, because we ended up going there for the next uh, 25 years, every That's summer. Right. Yeah, and you still go there? Yeah, so we still go there. Uh, yeah. I've, I've moved to California 25 years ago. I have yet to spend a summer in California. I don't know what it's like. Really? The only two summers <laughs> I spent in California were the two last years with COVID where yeah. I didn't go to the beach anyway. So, <laughs> so yeah. I don't, I've, I only have a sort of an indirect concept of what surf surfing is, is and like, I, I've never <laughs> had a chance to try it out. Um, I mean, I more familiar with Mars. I'm not necessarily trying California very hard either, summer. but but what I'm trying to convey here is that uh, I I have been spending all my summers for the past you know 25 years or so either at home with COVID or because of COVID or or on Devon Island and yeah. for 23 seasons on Devon Island, and it's it's wow. it's uh it's odd how such a godforsaken bleak place can be so. Uh, attractive you know uh, yeah it's it's literally like going to mars uh on an annual pilgrimage uh you know just to to see this incredible place when we have a base now that in fact we've had a base there a permanent base since uh, year two or three of our project since year three really and uh and so in some sense i i feel like i have a home a, sort of a summer home on devon island but, but the truth is it's a it's a few it's our fuel lab it's it's the you know the product of many people's uh, work and collaboration, uh, and you know I, I started the project and still run it, but I, I would not have been able to do it without uh, incredible people who helped along the way. The, the one who comes to mind is John Scott. John is um, a mountaineer by you know early training and a geologist. And, you know, he's climbed, he's summited uh, uh, several mountains in the Himalayas and the American Rockies. Um, but uh, he's, he's, he's famous for, for something that in mountaineering circles is sometimes known as the John Scott maneuver or, or uh, something to that effect. Uh, he was... Uh, on a line with somebody walking on a very narrow uh, ice uh, arete, you know, an ice ridge. And mm -hmm. his, his buddy to whom he was tied slipped and started falling off one side and basically not being able to stop. And there was a precipice if the guy had gone along. And John essentially dived the other side. So next thing you know, they were both on either side of this ice ridge of the snow ridge with precipices on, on both sides. Uh, yeah. But they were able to, to essentially climb back up to the edge and, and got out of it alive. That's but insane. it was thanks to his quick thinking to not allow himself to yeah. get, you know, pulled down the other way. Uh, yeah. And so, so anyway, that's, that's, that's John. So I met John while I was in graduate school, going to Antarctica to collect meteorites. He was the chief he is. And uh, he, but, he was at the time already the chief field guide of the U S program to collect meteorites in Antarctica. And I tented it with John for, for eight weeks, an incredible field person. And so when we went to Devon Island for the first time, uh, I asked if, if John could join us. And since then he's been coming up with us to Devon Island, you know, helping us with um, field guiding geology, the, the base camp, 
for the past 25 years. Okay, so we call him the bipolar guy. He spends his southern summers at the South Pole and northern summers at, at the north near the North Pole with us. <laughs> that's quite a life <laughs> quite a life yeah yeah john scott well, john scott alone is worth uh you know 10 of your shows he's got incredible <laughs> stories if you can get them out of him okay cool i have to try and find him um <laughs> let's talk a bit more about space and and our solar system and get onto the moon and mars and all that kind of thing um so I guess let's start with just a general kind of, is there anything, there's probably loads of things, but is there anything that comes to mind if I was to say, um, tell me something about our solar system that most people probably don't know, but probably should know? Yeah, um, uh, that's a great question. One of, the, one of the key lessons that we feel we're learning from Devon Island is that a lot of the terrain features that on Mars, we've gotten used to uh, attributing to a warm climate in Mars's past were actually have their equivalents on Devon Island. And on Devon Island, they were formed under glacial conditions. And so as much as there is actually the, the big mainstream thinking that Mars was once wet and warm, more Earth-like, in my view, that's very, uh, that's wishful thinking. That's a very geocentric view. I mean, we somehow need to find a, you know, claim that the place was, was wet and warm. Uh, what Devon Island tells you is that you can form all these water-related features under actually glacial conditions. And so the canyons that we see on Mars were not carved by liquid water, you know, cutting across the landscape like the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon. It's, it's different. On Devon Island, the canyons were carved by streams of ice essentially cutting into the rock. Uh, the valley networks that we see on Mars, which we assign to rainfall on Mars, follow, followed by water running, you know, running off as a, as a trickle and rivers of being on early Mars. Those are formed on Devon Island underneath ice sheets, underneath ice covers. Uh, so so what, we're, what Devon Island has been telling us, I think, is that Mars actually was never a warm place climatically. And this actually should be good news to people who try to model how Mars's climate has evolved over time. Uh, so I don't, I don't have time to go into a lot of details, but, but basically it's very difficult to make early Mars uh, wet and warm. So, so here's sort of how it happened. You know, the first pictures were returned from Mars back in the 70s. And, uh, uh, and then, the, in fact, the, the late 60s. And um, they, you know, we started seeing things like... Uh, dried up river beds. So the immediate claim was that Mars, these, these were formed by rainfall and, and therefore Mars once had a warmer climate. Okay. And, and so since then, climate modelers have been scratching their heads about how to make early Mars warm climate wise, because at the time the sun was 25% dimmer than it is today. The sun has been sort of going up to cruise speed. At the time this was happening, the sun was still uh, you know, in its infancy, uh, and we know that it was 25% dimmer than today. So, so how do you make a planet that is farther from the sun and the earth is today warmer than, it, than the, that planet is today while the sun itself was 25% dimmer? That's called the faint early sun paradox. The faint early sun paradox. The sun was fainter early in Mars's history, and yet there was the claim that you know, it, it, it was a warm climate on Mars. And this has really made planet modelers, climate modelers scratch their heads for, for several decades. In fact, they still are scratching their heads and they're coming up with solutions to make Mars warm climate wise that are really uh, outlandish, like very thick atmospheres, a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, greenhousing with other gases as well. It's just very difficult to do and you barely reach the freezing point or the melting point of water by, by doing that. Okay. It's very difficult to make Mars warm when the sun is that dim and cold. Uh, well, what we're saying from Devon Islands, there's no need, there's no need. Uh, a lot of this stuff could have been formed under a very cold climate on Mars. The only thing that was warmer at the time was the ground. The planet was young. Volcanism was more active. Impacts were more frequent. 
uh, the planet was younger. There was more heat flow coming out from the inside of the planet. Uh, but the surface itself was frigid, just as frigid as it is today. And there were ice covers. There were ice covers, but the ice was melting from its base. Uh, and that's what carved the valley networks. That's what ended up allowing the ice to ooze along and carve the canyons, at least some of the, some of the canyons on Mars. Uh, and all of a sudden, there is no more faint early sun paradox. There's no paradox. Faint sun was indeed faint, but Mars wasn't warm uh, climate-wise. Now, that is still not mainstream. Uh, you know, you will, you will hear all kinds of people explain to you that Mars once was wet and warm and had a warm climate, uh, you know. But that's how, and, and for some odd reason, that picture of Mars is actually more difficult to achieve, but it's the one to beat because... Uh, it's it's the one that came first. Yeah. The cold climate hypothesis, which we've been pushing, is harder to is still not mainstream because it didn't come first. But yet, it's a lot more. It's a lot more straightforward. It's you know, it's a lot more logical. It's a lot more straightforward. It's it's you know. So, but I'm confident that over time, and you know, we will eventually get there. Uh, mm. You know. Uh, People. Do you think it's also maybe hard for people to get their head around the fact it's red as well and like the red planet, everything about that kind of tells us it's warm and it's hot. hot and, yeah. uh, and like, you know, the, the, the big planets, Probably. you know, Uranus and Neptune are kind of blue and, and things like that. Maybe, and they feel... maybe for, for the public who's not sort of into the day to day of Mars science, sure. But I mean, I think for scientists... I'm not accusing any scientists of that, yeah, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Judging it based on this kind uh, of... <laughs> you know, I, I do think that some of my peers who are still pushing the Mars warm idea are, are blinded by the fact that there's quite a bit of wishful thinking uh, on, on how appealing an early Mars that was sort of more balmy and, and Earth-like uh, is. Mm. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's give that a little more time. You know, I, I once uh, heard this from Arthur C. Clarke. He said there were, there, were, there were four stages to people's reaction to your novel idea. Stage one is no, it's impossible. It's <laughs> plus it's not useful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you give it some time and then their, their reaction becomes stage two, which is um, okay. It's possible, but it's still not true or it's still not useful. Stage three is yeah, it's possible. It's true. And I always knew it. Yeah. <laughs> How did anybody not know it? Who exactly. are these people not believe? And in it? stage yeah. four is <laughs> yeah. And that was my idea. <laughs> yeah okay so yeah, i think there's a <laughs> so i think we're still in we're still in stage two for mars when it comes to yeah. early mars being cold um but we'll get there yeah there's probably lots of things going through those processes right now of human nature that we're gonna we're gonna see how much water is there on mars plenty plenty uh in fact i, I jokingly say that nasa announces discovery of water once a year just for for funding uh purposes but Mars is replete with water. It's mostly frozen. It's mostly in the ground, but there's a little bit of it in the atmosphere even. And there, of course, there's, there are polar ice caps where the water ice is near the surface. Um, but, the, you know, whether or not Mars has water is no longer the question at all. Uh, mm. What may be a question is, to what extent has it been available in liquid form near the surface yeah. or at the surface, especially in the present conditions? You can actually have even... Uh, water be liquid under present climate conditions if it's salty enough. Uh, I mean, as you know, pure water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Uh, salty water like seawater at, uh, freezes at around minus four degrees Celsius because the salt depresses the, the freezing point, lowers the freezing point. And that's because we're talking about table salt, you know, sodium chloride. If you're talking about perchlorates, which are a kind of salt that are abundant on Mars, the freezing temperature of, of perchlorate-rich water is minus 70 degrees C. So you can keep water liquid even at minus 70 degrees C if you have the right kind of salts uh, you know, concentrated in that, in that brine. Uh, and so there's the thinking that since perchlorates do exist on Mars in abundance uh, and there might be ice, there could be places where there could be liquid brines uh, parts of the year. Uh, but 
that's still not going to be a large amount. And, mm. you know, the bulk of Mars's water uh, is frozen in the ground. Now, if you go deep enough, and we're talking about two to five kilometers of depth, eventually, just like when you go down a mine, it, it gets warmer and warmer. Eventually, the temperature increases and the water in the ground becomes liquid. And there could be uh, an entire biome, a uh, whole world of living uh, stuff yeah. uh, in the deep Mars underground. And I think that's part, you know, really plausible for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, some people will say, well, you know, if, if there was really that much life in the underground of Mars, it would have figured out how to colonize the surface by, by now and some it would be everywhere. But I say no. I mean, you look at the Arctic, for example, that there's clearly less life uh, there at the surface than there is, you know, farther south. And there's barely yeah. any life actually at the surface. So, so you, you do get to a point where you reach the limit of life. And if, if it's the difference be, between being underground and at the surface, well, that's, that's the boundary. You keep looking at the surface for life. You will never find it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you just won't find any trace of it, especially in a place where there isn't that much exchange between the fluids between the, the underground and the surface. Uh, but the other thing is we should remember that on earth, uh, over 90% of the Earth's biomass is underground. Okay, over 90% by mass, by weight, of what is living on Earth <clears throat> is underground. I mean, you can wipe out all life at the surface of the Earth. It could look like a barren desert, a post-apocalyptic uh, nuclear, and I'm not suggesting we go that route, of course, but I'm just saying if we, if we wiped out all life at the surface of the Earth, no worries, there's still 90% of it uh, yeah. safe on the ground. Okay. Wow. Uh, don't try this at home. But uh, it's, you know, so to first order, life on earth is under the earth surface. And yeah. to first order, I wouldn't be surprised if life on Mars was underneath the surface. And it would be, you know, which is why we've been advocating, I've been advocating that we explore caves sooner rather than later on Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. especially caves that are easy to access. There, there are some giant volcanoes on Mars that have lava tube entrances that are gaping holes in the ground. Um, I mean, they're not exactly easy to explore, but they are within our capabilities. Potentially accessible. Potentially accessible. And as soon as you're into a cave on the side of a volcano, and all of a sudden all bets are off because now you're in a, an environment that's, shielded from space radiation, micrometeorites, it, it's, you're, you're sheltered uh, from UV light that will destroy life at the surface of Mars. Uh, and then you might even have warmth if the volcano is still active. We, we know that the latest, one of the latest volcanic eruptions on Mars was maybe only 50,000 years ago. So that's very recent. Uh, and for all we know, the giant volcanoes of Mars are still active. They're just not erupting this minute, but they, they are still active. And then uh, even if they're not super warm, there might be still moisture being released. Uh, you know, water vapor is what comes out of most volcanoes. Uh, so, you know, you could have all the right ingredients to create a, a habitat for life uh, in, a, in a cave, in a volcanic cave on Mars, if the volcano is still a bit active. Yeah. So that to me is really intriguing, and that's where we should focus our our attention. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so we, we got to this point because you were asking me, you know, what what discoveries uh, do I find particularly interesting about the solar system? So I just gave you one that is actually from our work on Devon Island. It's 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 the notion that Mars was not a warm, balmy place in its past, but instead a cold, frigid yeah. desert. But nevertheless, uh, liquid water was still available because the, gro the, the ground was warm early in Mars's history. And therefore there could be life on Mars, even if it wasn't a mm. balmy place. Yeah. And, you know, we, we just have to look for it. The, the other thing that I, I wanted to say about the science is that, um, you know, a lot of the search for life on Mars is happening right now at the surface. In fact, all of it is happening at the surface. We, we start drilling a little bit into rocks, but, but, the surface we, we now really understand is, 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 is a terrible place for any form of light that would be close to what our understanding of life. I mean, it's, it's zapped by ultraviolet light. 
the ultraviolet light that you get at the surface of Mars is 800 times more intense than what you have uh, on Earth. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to spend an afternoon at the beach on Mars. You just spend a few <laughs> seconds and you're good to go. You can do yeah. a zap. Uh, and then there's space radiation. Space radiation on Earth is stopped by two things. The Earth's, man- uh, the Earth's atmosphere, which is very thick, and the magnetic field of the Earth, which is very strong. Mars has only a thin atmosphere that doesn't do much to stop space radiation. And it has no magnetic field today. So, so right there, th- th- there's no shielding f- uh, of significance to, to space radiation. Uh, so so that, that's very bad for life. Uh, if then the temperatures are super cold, so there's no liquid water available. And even if life somehow was using some other solvent, which I think is unlikely because water is really uh, you know, special, uh, there's no other liquid either at the surface of Mars. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's not good. Uh, and so, of course, there's always the claim that, well, we should be looking for something that's really alien. And would we even recognize if we saw it? Well, the answer is maybe not, but we still have to start looking for something that we, we could identify as life. And mm-hmm. we, we use the criteria that we have here on earth to identify earth life, of course, to, to, to look for life there. But, uh, my, my, my sense that is that even if, say, so right now we're looking for signs of past life. We're looking for biosignatures, chemical traces of life, but also uh, settings in which life might have been happy in the past, where there might have been more water, which is why we go to places like, like Jezero Crater. And, but, you know, even if, even if the Curiosity or the Perseverance rover drove through a road cut on Mars with giant dinosaur bones sticking out, you know, or bones of a beast sticking out of the, the road cut, we wouldn't be able to tell if that's alien life or not. We would not be able to tell if it's alien life or not. Okay. And that's something that is really worth uh, realizing because first of all, on earth, uh, all life on earth is part of the same genetic tree of life. We all use DNA, you, me, my dog, the squirrels, the mushrooms outside, the trees, all past life, we all use DNA with the same specific DNA bases. We just have different uh, coding of the DNA, but the language of earth life is common to all. There's no exception to that. And in fact, all life forms on earth, past or present, share some fraction of their DNA in common. That, That makes us all part of the same family tree. Okay. Now, uh, the straightforward interpretation of this, of course, is that we, we all spring from the same common primitive ancestor of which we have no more record in the fossil record. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, it's a fact that we all share uh, genetic material in common. Okay? And the whole idea here about finding alien life on Mars is to find the first example of life that does not plot onto the Earth's genetic tree of life. And I say DNA, for those of you who are purists out there, you know, might be biologists, we're talking about the, the, the 16S ribosomic RNA tree, okay? But the point is, it's still, what we mean by that is that it's, it's still your genetic uh, belonging or affiliation to, to the tree. What we're looking for on Mars is the first example of something that would be of another tree form yeah. of life that is not of the earth. Now, it could be that life on Mars is actually from the earth. We have on earth meteorites that have come naturally from Mars. A giant asteroid or a comet hits Mars. Mars rocks get kicked up into space. They drift through space. Some land on earth. They get picked up by people like me looking for meteorites in Antarctica, but you know anybody can find a meteorite. Uh, and the point is life could have... St- started on Mars, seeded the earth, we could all be descendants of primitive Martians if life started on Mars. But in that case, life on Mars would be part of the same tree as our tree of life. Or life could have started on earth and could have seeded Mars because the earth itself was hit by asteroids and comets. Pieces of earth could be sitting on Mars today and have transported earth bugs, you know, to Mars, which could have gained a foothold on Mars. So, Just because we find a life form on Mars doesn't necessarily mean that we found alien life. We have found life that has, that's living on an alien planet, but it's not necessarily alien life. 
Uh, mm. And so this whole search for past life on Mars and fossils and biosignature, all of that, in my view, is, is interesting, but it's, it's, it's on a path that is not going to get us the answer of what we are asking. Yeah, it's just more questions. It's just more questions. Like. <laughs> and yeah. like I said, you run into this road cut with giant things sticking out of the wall that look like a, a, a beast. You still cannot conclude if it's alien. It could be just somehow something that is. Uh, and of course, if you found a truly alien life on Mars, that's the big question because uh, if within our solar system, there are already you know two different origins of life, two different forms of life. Well, then of course that implies that the universe could be full of life and that has many implications. Mm. If on the other hand, life you find on Mars is still just Earth life exported a long time ago to Mars. Well, then that doesn't really tell you anything about how pervasive life is in the universe. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's why this question is so, so important and relevant. And the only way you could establish that what you have found on Mars is truly alien is to do genetics on it. Right? You have to show that, hey, this is really weird. It, it is not DNA now as we know it, or it's not, it's, it's some form of DNA, but it doesn't use the same acid bases as, uh, and bases as, as Earth DNA does. For you to do genetics on a Martian life form, it has to still be alive or dead for right. not a long time. For it to be alive, you have to find it alive. It is unlikely to be at the surface. It has to be underground. Uh, well, it's more, most likely underground if it's there at all. Uh, yeah. and, and that's why we should stop wasting our time roaming the barren plains of Mars and go inside where there are entrances. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. I'd love to see that. Work. Hopefully, you'll be able to convince some people to to do that. Um, so, do you think if you had to put your money on it, do you think? And I know it's hard to say, but is there life on Mars? Are there whatever it is, microbes or little little you know things? <laughs> is there life? Up I, there I right wouldn't now? be surprised if there was life on Mars. I think uh, it would be in the interior of Mars. I mean, not at the mm. core, of course, where it's hot and there's a nucleus that's you know. There might even be a little iron core. And, and we, we're talking about underneath the surface, but near the surface, nevertheless, yeah. at the scale of the planet. Uh, but underground, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we found life there, and I wouldn't be surprised if it were alien life, something that's really different yeah. from Earth life. Yeah. Um, wow, that would be cool. Yeah. It would be very cool. Do you think there's many other places in our solar system where there's that possibility? Yeah. Like, for example, Europa. Yes. And I'm sure there's others that you're going to list off maybe. Yes, you're right. Europa, this this icy moon of Jupiter that uh, just looks like a smooth ice ball on the outside with some cracks, but there's a there's a deep ocean uh, underneath this crust. It's about uh, 100 kilometers deep, so the crust mm-hmm. itself is maybe 20 kilometers, but underneath there, there's there's a you know murky dark ocean 100 kilometers deep. 100 kilometers deep. Think about it. Our the deepest yeah. part of our own oceans, the Mariana Trench, are 11 kilometers deep. This is an ocean that's a hundred kilometers deep, uh, yeah. you know. It's mind-boggling uh, numbers, isn't it? What's lurking underneath, uh, and the reason why there's an ocean is because there's a source of warmth uh, from the tides, yeah. uh, but possibly also from radioactive decay inside Europa, and therefore there could be uh, there could be life down there. Yeah. In fact, I, I have a painting. Are we talking? That, yeah. <laughs> Go Sorry, ahead. go. On. What's your, your painting? No, no. no I was, was going to say, say I, I normally I actually dabble in painting. Um, well, I paint. I paint uh, space landscapes and, and spaceships. But I have this one painting where I try to depict us landed on Europa, where Arthur C. Clarke actually said in in, the, in his novel 2010, The Space Odyssey, uh, or I think it has a different title, 2010, actually. Uh, he says, you know, uh, you can land anywhere you want in the solar system uh, except Europa. Do not land on Europa. So anyway, <laughs> it's a painting that dep- depicts us. It's called Except Europa. And uh, it depicts that, sure enough, we've landed on Europa, but then right underneath the ice, there's a giant beast that's lurking uh, in, in the deep ocean that's sort of floated to the Maybe sea. you can send me a picture of the picture. and I can, I'll like, send you a picture of the picture, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. That'd be cool. But the point is, um, uh, you, Europa... Do you think there's microbial life? under the in the in the ocean 
yeah. Uh, so that's the most probable thing, right? You're absolutely right. Microbial life first, because that's what came first. And that's, you know, for bulk of the bulk of Earth's history, the Earth was, had only microbial life. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether or not the life has had time and the opportunity to evolve into bigger beasts is, is unclear. You know, it, it takes a lot to feed a big beast. So mm-hmm. you, you need, uh, it has to make Lots sense in the sort of ecology and biosphere of yeah. Europa for there to be big beasts, but it, it's possible. I mean, you might need big beasts to, to break the ice, maybe, mm. you know, to create yeah. uh, places where somehow. I'm all in on fish on Europa, at least. I'm all in on there some, yeah. being some European fish. Yeah, why not? I mean, that's insane. The 100 kilometers depth of, I didn't realize it was 100. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it is the, insane. The liquid ocean. So, um, so there are plants. And there's loads of other places right? yes. with ice and stuff. Yes. So even Ganymede and Callisto, the other moons of, of uh, Jupiter, uh, might actually have some, some layer of slush or ocean underneath their, their crusty surface. So those are interesting places too. But the other, of course, the other big ocean place is Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn now. It's also a smooth icy ball on the outside. But Enceladus is interesting because it's it's got it's got geysers of of water spewing out through the cracks of the surface ice from that ocean that's underneath. So that ocean is also about uh, sixty or so kilometers deep, uh, and and uh, and rather than needing to sort of d- d- go diving into that ocean with a robot. There is there's the idea of actually flying through the plumes of it's a it's an idea by a professor at Cornell called uh, Jonathan Lunin. Uh, I mean a few others have that idea too, but but the concept is very good in my view. It's very exciting. It's it's uh, you know rather than bothering to land on the surface or or to go let alone go underneath the ice, which is really, really difficult to reach, you just fly through these jets of water that are getting spewed uh, through the cracks of uh, of Enceladus. And of course, in the process, you can you can analyze what's coming out, and maybe you'll see signs of life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So there are actually quite a few possibilities of places within our solar system. There might be that, even that liquid water harbor. in the deep subsurface of Pluto right now. So, wow. so who knows? Uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised actually if we lived in a solar system that's teeming with microbial life, uh, and of course, one alien to the other. I wouldn't be that surprised. You know, I mean, of course yeah. it'd be worth writing a paper if you found it, but, but uh, I wouldn't be that surprised, uh, which is to say that, you know, uh, there could be microbial life really throughout the galaxy in a, in a very big way. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so on Mars and life on Mars, what about us going there? And, and obviously there's some ideas of colonization in, in terms of the, the basics, like we're going to be going there at some point quite soon, uh, whether we stay or not. But how do you see it all looking like the whole thing? And, and I'm a little bit conscious of time as well. So I don't want kind of we, we don't, want to, don't want to stay on Mars for like an hour. But just your thoughts on, you know, people going there, people staying there when you think it's likely to happen. Is it going to be smooth? How that's going to look? just any thoughts yeah i th- i think that humans going to mars will be the the greatest space adventure we have in the 21st century i see it happening this century uh, uh i think that it's still going to be harder than we think and might take longer than we would like but um uh, i think the earliest time frame in which we could see this happen is going to be the mid 2030s uh, and then the mid 2040s, by between then and the mid 2040s, so as a, as an earliest time frame, that's in my view reasonably uh, possible for it to happen. Now, do you think before that? Sorry, just to cut in for a sec. Do you think before that we'll be able to put like the Elon Musk's big rockets up there just with stuff rather than people? Yeah, th- that's that's including that. I'm talking about people though. I'm talking about people. Yeah, yeah. beforehand. But that's in that time yeah. frame. That's yeah, yeah late, okay. late 2020s, ahead. early 2030s. We might have stuff going there. But cool. but people landing at the surface of Mars, I don't see that happening before the mid 2030s at the earliest. And mm-hmm. you know, I'm not being pessimistic. I've just live, I, I work on this and I've live with the issues for for quite a while. There, there's several issues. One is is uh, right now, 
uh, NASA has a sort of classic way of going to Mars that is still credible in my view. But of course, there's no formal funding that is pushing us to Mars this minute. We're going back to the moon in a big way for now. And the idea of going to Mars is sort of as a, as a, as a follow on. Although the way we do the moon in the short term is supposed to set the stage for Mars. That's how NASA is supposed yeah. to be doing it, okay? Which I think to, to some degree, it, it really is. Now, uh, which is to say that we could still make this self-imposed uh, deadline of getting to Mars, starting to go to Mars by the mid-2030s and landing people there in the early 2040s. Now, mm -hmm. The private sector, of course, is a wild card. Elon has his has his uh, his sights set on Mars and getting people there, but uh, it's still something that's going to be quite a bit more difficult to do than what uh, Elon has achieved so far, uh, and and quite a bit more expensive. Uh, I mean, in Elon's scenario, for example, there are, there are two key things that have to happen for for his scenario to to even work. One is on orbit refueling where he has, uh, you see, he launches a, a rocket into a starship rocket into Earth orbit first. But then by the time it gets there, it's, it doesn't have enough fuel anymore to go to Mars. So now you need to launch subsequent rockets that will refuel it to, so that it leaves Earth with a full fuel tank. Now, then that thing goes, so that refueling thing hasn't happened yet. And, you know, mm. it's, it hasn't been done because it's difficult to do. And it's not to say that, therefore, Elon will make it, but it's just that, you know, uh, we had flown rockets before. Uh, this is something really new. So it has yeah, to be yeah. it has to be done, it has to be mastered, it has to be done safely, okay? Uh, and then you go to Mars, where uh, if you just go to Mars, you're going to end up without enough fuel once you get there. So now you have to pre-position fuel on Mars and send several, several rocket ships with fuel to Mars, uh, so that they can refuel the one rocket that's going to come back to the Earth. Okay, mm. uh, so, you know, so so there's a lot of launches that are going to be needed for for this scenario to sort of work in the short term. And then, of course, there's the desire that actually that the fuel be made on Mars, which of course is being tested now in Perseverance by NASA, but in a very preliminary and embryonic way. Uh, we're talking about things that have to be operational. For, for you to be really able to send, you know, people reasonably safely to Mars and back. Uh, I, I'm definitely not in the camp of naysayers, but I don't think we're doing the concept or the idea any service by saying that it's easy and we can, we can pull it off in no time because yeah. that's, that's not, that's not helping. <laughs> that's not how we should realize the magnitude of the challenge. Uh, but at the same time, you know, go for it now. Yeah. Um, I there, there are a few other things that really have to be worked out. Okay, uh, first of all, the surface of Mars is a godforsaken place. I mean, uh, you think Devon Island is bad? Mars is super deadly for humans. I mean, I often explain that, you know, if you just walk onto the surface of Mars unprotected, there are, there are sort of five things that will kill you, uh, and here they are in chronological order of cause of death. Okay, the first thing that will kill you within seconds is the low atmospheric pressure. Your, the, the oxygen and nitrogen in your bloodstream would just boil uh, and you would essentially fizz to death within seconds. If that didn't kill you, you, you cannot breathe the Martian atmosphere. It lacks oxygen, so you would die of hypoxia, lack of oxygen to your brain in particular, uh, within minutes. Uh, but on top of that, the CO2 that the atmosphere is made of is toxic. So you're also getting carbon dioxide poisoning by breathing the Martian atmosphere. So, so that will kill you within minutes. If that didn't kill you, then the temperatures will. The temperature on Mars is on average minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 63 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's the average temperature. If you just stood on Mars, you are frozen to the bones by the end of the Martian day, uh, which is luckily only 24 hours and 37 minutes. <laughs> Okay, uh, um, so very close to the Earth Day, uh, but nevertheless, you you are frozen to the bone uh, within hours. Okay, uh, on Mars. Then, if that didn't kill you, then the dust is going to kill you, and that was one of the flaws in the movie in the book The Martian, 
the dust on Mars is bad news for three reasons. It's very fine grain, so it's going to clog the pores of your lungs. That's miner's disease. That's what people die of in coal mines. If that doesn't kill you, then uh, the, the, the dust is very shard-like, sharp, okay, cutting, because it's most, most, mostly a volcanic ash uh, that hasn't been weathered and smoothed by, by rivers and rain. Uh, so, so that's going to tear up the tissue of your lung of your lungs. And then the third thing is that the dust is toxic. It is replete with peroxides and perchlorates. That's going to attack your, your uh, lungs, your thyroid. Uh, you, you know, you're dead within weeks. So this notion of bringing tons of Martian dirt into the cabin to grow potatoes, that's bad at several levels. You, you are going to, first of all, breathe in this dust that will kill you within weeks. On top of that, the potatoes will be contaminated with the perchlorates. So there'll be poisonous potatoes. You're dead after your first meal. Uh, so, so no. Uh, okay. And then the radi space radiation, which everybody worries about, it's actually the last thing that will kill you. And I find it really ironic that we, we somehow say, wow, space radiation is such a showstopper uh, when there are so many other things that are more likely to kill you like radically and immediately on a trip to Mars, like the launch. <laughs> I mean, the launch yeah. is still a super risky thing. Uh, you know, no matter how you look at it, uh, and and space radiation, yeah, will kill you after a few many months or a few years of exposure. And I think the reason why it's so front and center on our concerns about going to Mars is because there's very little you can do about it. You know, you, you it's hard to shield yourself from it. It's expensive to to just put matter between you and the rest of the universe uh, to to absorb the radiation. So. So you're sort of stuck with taking some risk with that. But, in, in, you know, I mean, it's not a bad thing to die of, okay, if you've been to Mars a few years after you come <laughs> back. You know, I mean, that's all I can say. Uh, I, will, I will take that chance. So anyway, yeah. but here's an example of something that still needs to be worked, like the spacesuit. And on Devon Island, we've been working on the spacesuit mm -hmm. with the spacesuit makers of, uh, of NASA since... Uh, 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 you know, for the past 20 years. Uh, right now, the spacesuit that we have weighs 300 pounds. And I'm not entirely sure how much that is in kilos, but about 150 kilos. Okay, 300 mm -hmm. pounds. And uh, that, of course, is way too heavy for you to carry around. Uh, if you go to the moon where gravity is six times less, that 300 pound spacesuit feels like it weighs only uh, 50 pounds. 50 pounds is about 25 kilos. Uh, that is fairly manageable. I mean, it's like a heavy backpack, but that's why Apollo was even possible. Uh, we had astronauts able to walk because even though they had a heavy spacesuit on the moon, it was light enough for them to hop around. You take that same spacesuit to Mars, a 300 pound spacesuit on Mars would have a felt weight of 125 pounds. Gravity on Mars is 38% of that of the earth, not like on the moon where it's 17%, it's 38%. So a 300 pound spacesuit taken to Mars will have a felt weight of about 125 pounds. Okay, that's like 70 kilos, well, 65 kilos. Uh, that is really heavy. That yeah. is really heavy. Okay, and you cannot do field work with that. You can't hop around like we did on Apollo. Uh, going in caves and check out the going, uh, going down in caves and all that. So, so just a spacesuit alone. The the current challenge is to bring the mass of the spacesuit uh, down by half, which, if you can imagine, is a huge challenge. I mean, yeah. the spacesuit is not just clothing, as you know. It's it's uh, it's a wearable spacecraft, and um, we, we have to bring this mass of the spacesuit down you know, by half. So we have some solutions. I, I don't have time to get into that. We worked on some of those on Devon Island. Uh, you know, there, there's hope at the end of the tunnel here, uh, but yeah. it's a tunnel and it's gonna take uh, quite a few more years and some pretty hefty investing to really work through. So this notion that somehow we're ready to go as soon as Elon has the rocket to take us there is, is, is sort of glossing over a lot of the details of what would you even there if you went there right now? Because he doesn't have a spacesuit that could make us do anything useful on Mars. Uh, yeah. And it's not a criticism of Elon. I'm just saying, uh, in fact, I'm a fan of what he's doing in space. 
but uh, it's it's just to to point out that we're, we're doing nobody a, a favor by minimizing the magnitude of the enterprise. Mm. Yeah, maybe he needs to throw you a few million to get get finding a, a nice spacesuit. I like the way you think. Yeah, I'll I'll see if we can reach out to him. Um, so moving on from Mars a little bit because I, I know Mars is it's your favorite, and we could stay on Mars for ages. There's so much to talk about, but there's other planets we should just touch on them quickly as well. Man, and, and if you don't mind, I just want to say one thing more about humans going to Mars. I, I don't course. see Mars, of course. Yeah, I, I don't see Mars as a place where we will or should have a settlement of millions. Uh, mm. You know, to me, the future of Mars looks more like the future of Antarctica, uh, where we will have a research base uh, internationally run, hopefully, you know, in a friendly way with other nations or a few research bases in different locations. But where there might, just like in Antarctica, where there might also be a healthy tourism uh, industry where maybe, you know, 100 at a time, Elon can fly a group of people to go to Mars. The, the type of facility that I would see existing on Mars is something that would be more like a, a, a resort, you know, uh, maybe like a Disney resort in some sense, where sure, you go there to, you go to Mars, you can spend a few weeks there, you can try on a spacesuit, go out for spacewalks, maybe take a train ride to the edge of the canyon, a pressurized train ride to the edge of a canyon, um, you know, fly drones, uh, and otherwise enjoy some indoor facilities in this reduced gravity environment of Mars, which could be quite spectacular. Like imagine, uh, I'm working with a student on a paper about the water sports on the moon and Mars, you know, imagine, you know, you can jump from the highest dive board, uh, but land onto mm -hmm. the water much slower than on the yeah. earth. I mean, you can jump two and a half times higher on Mars than you can on the Earth. Uh, you know, a gym on Mars would be an amazing thing. A swimming pool could, you know, could be loads of fun. You, you die from the edge of the pool. You, you can leap like, you know, almost three times farther. Uh, <laughs> you know, you could have a blast doing that kind of stuff. But that's not motivation yeah. for having a city of a million where you have, you know, industry. I mean, there's no running water outside. You can't even get rid of your waste other than by recycling it completely. And we're far from me being able to do that. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, plus what would you do there? And kids growing up there would never get a breath of fresh air. It would all be just, you know. Um, do you think there would be some people that would want to do that? Yes. Though? Maybe go and yes. live there and be part yes. of a small colony to, to, to help us become, yeah, multi-planetary. Just and, like there are, you know, if, in my view, just like there are park rangers who who live in the wilderness of their parks year round and, and are the people who are the keepers of those places. There will be opportunities for people to spend, you know, maybe even move there with their little family. But that's very different mm -hmm. from, from imagining, you know, a bustling city of, yeah. of, of stuff going on because it's like, I, I don't get the point of that. And that there really isn't that opportunity. In, in fact, in my view, we are, well, first of all, Chile and Argentina, for example, tried that, right? They, they wanted to claim pieces of the Antarctic pie and they had built housing units in Antarctica in the sixties and seventies wow. to encourage families to go there and, you know, bring up kids. And uh, it didn't work. It didn't work. Mm. And now these, these housing units are d deserted and it's, they're just relics uh, because you can't control, you can't create an economy where, where, <laughs> where there's no point for it. Uh, so I, I, I do see, like I said, a, a very bright future for Mars with tourism uh, as, a, as a fun place to go to. We would treat the whole planet like a national park or at least a global park. Uh, mm. we, we would do science there. Uh, and as far as moving people into space, I think what's a lot more plausible and actually easier to do are, are big stations in Earth orbit or between the Earth and the moon or around the moon, uh, you know, big cities in space like that, where at least you are close yeah. to the Earth and you, you can, you know, start really supplying that thing with, with everything you need. And then the other hope is that we will master at some point interstellar travel. So, you know, yeah, with James Webb's telescope, we're likely to find uh, the first planets that are actually livable for us that might have an oxygen rich atmosphere and therefore probably life on mm -hmm. them if there's oxygen. Um, and, and so we could journey to those places and colonize those places. 
uh, yeah. you know, where, you know, you have a world that's, that's welcoming. Um, and then Mars will just be like, you know, the Faroe Islands, no offense. Uh, when we travel <laughs> to, you know, in other words, <laughs> not a place where a huge amount of the population will migrate to. Yeah. Okay. Like a desert. You go there to, to look at some rocks and observe things and, you know, yeah, learn some stuff. But ultimately there's a lot more to do on earth or super earth. And I want to point out that I would dream of, I dream of going to the Faroe Islands. I think it would be an amazing place to visit. And I, I've never been, I have the ultimate respect for them. But I, all I'm saying is it's not, it's not where somehow we decided to build a giant city, uh, you know, mm. and, uh, and move all of earth there. So we've we've had your bet. You you bet that there's life on or under. We should say we're in Mars. But now now you're in terms of the year that we first send a manned mission outside of our solar system, our first interstellar mission. Are we talking a hundred years? One hundred and fifty. I see humans on Mars in twenty forty seven. What about the first interstellar? First interstellar. That's a bit more of a guess because it depends on when we actually have a technological breakthrough that will allow it. Um, yeah. if we, if we go the hibernation route, which I think is actually possible. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I mean, you should know that we, we actually might have a lot to learn from the Inuit, uh, you know, the, the people of the Arctic that we used to call Eskimos, the Inuit, mm-hmm. uh, especially the ancient Inuit would winter over, uh, spend their, their incredibly harsh winters, mostly in this semi in this state of hibernation, but of suspended animation, it's called torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. Torpor is something that we have as an ability in our human bodies uh, to sort of get into a state of, uh, in which our metabolic rates have slowed down, our heart rate is down, our need for nutrients is down, our need to urinate is down, our need to a breathing rate is down. Uh, you know, there are different grades of hibernation. This is, this is not a sub-zero hibernation, but it's a rate where our metabolic uh, activity is dramatically decreased, a state of torpor. And it's something that the Inuit had ma- mastered because that's how they would survive the winters. They would, you know, gather and hunt in the spring and summer, uh, sort of get ready for lockdown in the fall. And then throughout the winter months when it's dark, cold, super cold. They would just uh, remain in this semi-vegetative state uh, of torpor uh, uh, where you are essentially in, in dreamland um, uh, you know, for, for a few months. And mm. um, uh, such a state is something that we, we should uh, sort of learn how to to, to master in our bodies again, uh, at the very least as a contingency for astronauts on their way to Mars, for example. I mean, what if something fail or, uh, you know, they, they run out of food or the food get contaminated? I mean, what, what if there's some catastrophic uh, event yeah. where they somehow have to spend, I don't know, another year in Mars, you know, in space, or they, they have to, they miss the flyby and have to come back in a different, I mean, there could be a circumstance where people would have to spend a lot longer in space than they had planned or somehow uh, are minus the resources that they, they had planned on having. And knowing that they ha- they would have the ability to, to go into a state of minimal consumption of consumables, uh, like a state of torpor would be really, uh, you know, a powerful tool to have. So I, I think that we could journey to Titan for example, in the future by doing it partially in hibernation. I mean, it would take uh, a few years to get to Titan. Uh, Titan, incidentally, is, a, would, is actually more forgiving than Mars to explore. It's just farther away, uh, but yeah. it has a thicker atmosphere than even the Earth's. The atmosphere is made mostly of nitrogen, which is not toxic for us. Uh, it has otherwise a lot of methane, which is not toxic for us. Uh, of course, we don't have oxygen, but then on Titan, you have enough air pressure that you don't need a pressurized spacesuit. You just need to have an oxygen mask uh, and probably a full body suit to, to shield you from things like hydrogen cyanide. That's a little bit present in the atmosphere, but 
uh, it's all in all uh, a place that's a lot more forgiving to, to, to live on. And then meanwhile, the gravity is even less than on the moon. Uh, the moon's gravity yeah. is 17% of that of the earth. Titan is 14%. So you could, wow. you could hop around and make giant leaps and walk on water <laughs> almost. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> On Titan. Uh, wow. So, anyway, uh, I digress. But Titan is something we should, t- to me, is, you know, offers at least, I mean, a city on Titan would make almost more sense than on Mars. Okay. Because at least there are liquids, there's a hydrologic cycle. I mean, there's, there's a, uh, you know, organic liquid uh, cycle. You could imagine, I mean, it's, it's a place that would be easier to manage. Uh, other than the cold, than than Mars, Mars is okay. Mars is really harsh, wow. uh, and yeah. then you don't have radiation. I mean, that's the other thing. You have a thick atmosphere, so you don't have radiation to worry about. I mean, it's just uh, it's better in many ways. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, other planets in our so when Titan, uh, I'll just be twenty one hundred, twenty one hundred. When Titan, Titan, you know, people going to Titan twenty one hundred. This mic. Right. Okay. That's your that's your prediction. Yeah, the beginning okay, of the twenty nice. second century, the first, yeah, the first manned mission to Titan. I mean, none of this is happening soon enough, which is part of the reason yeah. why I like to paint uh, our future because it's born out of frustration, partly. Or, or yeah, I want to see it. It's gonna, you know, it will be our kids and grandkids, I suppose, that will get to see these things. But yeah. that's quite cool in itself yeah. that you know, there's people interstellar travel, maybe in maybe the, at the end it. of the next of next century, yeah, where we we actually yeah. send people out there. And, yeah. And it might, it could come quicker, right? Because when yeah. we, we make these advancements and they seem to make other advancements a lot closer and, and think exponential growth and all that kind of thing, we might click and it just might yeah. might happen in a, in a short space of time. Of course, it's still probably decades at least, but yeah. Um, let me ask you a couple of kind of quick fire questions almost, uh, things that I had kind of in my mind to ask you and we kind of passed the subject. So on Mars, I read recently that there are some like purple coatings on some of the rocks that they've discovered. I, I think this was very recent, so I don't know if you've heard about it or seen much about it. Um, some of them were completely purple, but they believe it's a coating. Some of them have like what looks like splashes or like, uh, you know, of, of this purple color. Have you, have you come yeah. across that? Well, First of all, generally, uh, one should be very careful about uh, colors on Mars because they're often off and the way we often process the pictures or others often process the pictures will make some of your dunes look blue and, you know, the rocks look a lot bluer than they normally are. Uh, But the other thing is the purplish coating is actually real, but it's more like it's a brownish, uh, it's more like just a deep brown. And it's, it's believed to be iron oxide mostly. And iron oxide, if you look carefully, can be purple on Earth. Uh, it's just rust, basically. It's, isn't it's it? just a, a, a deep old rust with patina on it. Uh, mm-hmm. So you can have, it's a bit like desert varnish, it's called, or desert patina. You know, you, you go into some deserts, you, you see that the, the rocks acquire this very smooth um, uh, s- sort of... Uh, antiquated uh, rind that uh, can be a dark brown to reddish brown and and from there a bit purple. Cool. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to stay true to my word of quickfire and jump into the next one. So on these gas giants, a la Saturn, Jupiter, um, how do we know there's not a rocky planet in the middle of that thick atmospheric Uh, gas? We we do know, we do think that there is a rocky core. Uh, and we do so, think there is. Okay. In fact, cool. in Jupiter, there's something that's probably the size of the Earth, uh, right at the center. Of course, it's quite a bit denser, uh, and it's super hot by then. So there's a there's there's molten rock for sure, and molten metals in the in the core. Mm-hmm. Uh, and above that, something very odd happens. I mean, Jupiter is mostly hydrogen, and uh, the hydrogen is at such a high pressure that the electrons are squeezed out of each hydrogen atom, uh, squeezed loose. So you go deep enough inside Jupiter, the pressures become so high that the electrons are basically squeezed out of the atoms of, of protons and you know neutrons that they're going around. And all of a sudden you have loose electrons, which means that it's conducting. It's, it's how electricity gets conducted. 
And so you, as you go deeper and deeper into Jupiter, you transition to this metallic hydrogen, uh, which is sort of a really interesting state of matter, uh, a conducting metallic fluid uh, of yeah. hydrogen. And then deeper down, you have the densest stuff that's just, you know, fallen there. Uh, and, you know, that's where you have molten rock. And so you might not have a solid rocky surface. Uh, until you get to maybe a solid iron core, which is which is questioned. Yeah, but we think there's probably something there, probably something solid. There, there probably is condensed matter that's really solid because it's at such a high pressure in spite of the temperature. So there, there, there could be a solid yeah. iron core at the very center. But, but uh, you know, then you have issues of different models of how much iron do you actually have, etc. So, so that's that's less clear. Yeah. Yeah, well, just like the fish on Europa, I'm I'm going with there's a rocky planet somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My but, I mean, it, it's not really <laughs> like you could have a you know I mean on the other hand on Saturn you might have lesser temperatures and you could have a solid rocky core and certainly in the in the center of Uranus and Neptune you could. But, yeah. Uh, so so you know the, whether or not you could call that a landscape you could stand on technically I mean you know, it's it's a uh, hard, it's to, hard say. to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay what about planet nine um do you think there's a and i'm not talking about pluto yeah. unfortunately but yeah the the big old planet nine way out way out there do you think there's there is one what are your thoughts on it yeah there, there's very that's very intriguing so you know the the notion here is that there are some unexplained perturbations of the planets uh even the farthest out uh there's the sense that there could be a largest planet really far out and I, at this point, with so many surprises we've had in our studies of the solar system, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a large planet out there. So planet nine would be the size of the Earth or even larger, uh, maybe even the size of Neptune, uh, but really far out. And, you know, whether or not it's even a planet of our own solar system or somehow something that we sort of loosely captured uh, at some earlier stage is, is hard to tell. But we, we haven't found it yet. And it has so far escaped any sort of uh, purposed detection. But, you know, one thing we're finding more and more of are these rogue planets in our galaxy. So these are galaxies, these are planets about the size of Jupiter or, you know, in that sort of size range <clears throat> that are unbound to a star. They're just drifting through the galaxy like they were stars themselves. Uh, they might have started in stellar nurseries. Uh, you know, it just never made it to star status, you know, stellar star status. Mm. Uh, you know, they're like, they're like actors who didn't make it, but they're still <laughs> roaming. Through they're Hollywood. still hanging around. Uh, so, you know, uh, bad analogy maybe, but, but uh, they're, they're out there and they're very interesting. They're undiscovered talent is what I should say. Uh, yeah. 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 Wow. So you think there could be one or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, there could be then. these roguish things that are at the edge of our gravitational keep, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that, that could still be around us or, or maybe around us for a while until we, we pass near another star, in which case they might just jump ship and, you know, yeah. move on. Yeah. Pastures new. Um, I guess there's lots of people that know about, you know, like the the eight planets, the the nine with Pluto, if we want to be nice and include Pluto. In. But there's so many bodies in our solar system, right, that maybe people don't realize. Like when we're talking about dwarf planets like Pluto and um, Ceres and Sedna, and there's, there's loads, right? So I wasn't I wanted to ask you, hey, how many dwarf planets do we know of in our solar system, even if it's a 100. rough estimate? And, and how big does it have? Like, what's the minimum size to be a dwarf planet? Because I'm assuming we wouldn't just count like, you know, like a, a stone flowing through, floating through space as a, a dwarf planet. So they have to be a certain size or is it characteristics they have to have? Or Yeah, so to be a dwarf planet, well, to be a planet at all, including a dwarf planet, you have to be independently going around. You have to be the principal planet going around your, you know, your own way around, around your star. Uh, now, okay. as far as a lower limit to what, how do you transition from a large comet, or large asteroid to a dwarf planet, uh, I'm not aware of any particular you know firm definition of that uh, uh but um uh i for one am not really in favor of this uh distinction between a dwarf planet and a planet i mean in my view the fact mm -hmm. that we've been finding more and more of these 
should just update the list of planets we have uh, going around uh, the sun. Uh, I was of the opinion, actually, that anything uh, that's roundish uh, and a thousand kilometers or more in radius, in diameter, sorry, in a thousand kilometers or more uh, across should be considered uh, a planet. And everything else, you know, uh, an icy body or, you know, an asteroid or a comet or, or you know, like they say, uh, you know, other Kuiper Belt objects. But if it, if it reaches a thousand kilometers in diameter or more and it's going independently around the sun, it should be considered a planet. And, you know, the moon in that regard, our own moon should be considered a planet too. I mean, it just happens to be a planet that is in orbit around another one. Uh, but it, it, it has planetary stature, not just because of its proximity to us, but because it's a, it's a significant body in, in, in size. Uh, so yeah. so I, I tend to sort of go even the other way, which is to, 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 to consider that we should name some of our, we should consider some of our moons to be, to be planets, uh, mm. you know, and, and just add to them to the fact that they are planets that are in orbit around others. Yeah, I think why I think you're right because when people think of a planet or a moon or a, a dwarf planet, it brings to mind completely different connotations. <clears throat> Even somebody who doesn't really know about it, you know, you think a moon, oh, it's like our moon, it's that little thing in the sky that that's near a planet. It's not that important, and and a dwarf planet, you think, oh, it's it's tiny, it's not, but they are fascinating, right? And they are interesting, and and there's not that much difference, I guess, in in a lot of ways, except that it it orbits the planet because they can still have tectonic activity. They yeah, can and still if, have... if Pluto's proven anything, it's that this this these are wild, complex worlds that you know the, the term dwarf doesn't do anything to help understand yeah. their their history, their origin. Uh, plus, the, I mean, you know, they're barely dwarf because. I mean, Pluto is very close in size to 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 Mercury, you know. So, so, so mm. we're not calling Mercury a dwarf planet. So, and there are moons bigger than Mercury right, as well in exactly. our solar system. So, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, let's start. A, let's start a campaign to get Pluto back into planetary <laughs> status and uh, yeah. right. <laughs> bring uh, some others with it. Alan Stern, uh, who of course was the PI of the new, who is the PI of the New Horizons uh, mission, is is I think in favor of you know, not using the term dwarf planet, uh, you know, and uh, he and I think his students uh, have been, you know, leading the charge in terms of just maintaining Pluto's status. So, so yes. I, I think what I'm trying to say is that if you want to revive that, uh, that battle, we, I'm on board and, but you, you can also count on them as well. Nice, nice. Because I have to say, I, as a child, I felt quite sad when I got that news that Pluto had been, you know, lost its planetary status. Yeah. That was a sad Yeah, day. it's just, I think <laughs> so much of it has to do with just our reluctance to to change our perception of mm. a solar system that just has like 10 or, or, you know, however less, fewer planets and, yeah. and grant that status only to something that is really, you know, big and massive out there. But it, it's really we should adapt on the contrary to what the solar system turns out to be. And if, yeah. if, if it has, and I, I, again, I think a thousand kilometers is sort of a nice round number that will, that will include Ceres, for example, the largest asteroid would mm -hmm. be a planet, which it is. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, I thought it was a, a dwarf planet. So it's not even a dwarf planet. Oh, it is a dwarf asteroid, planet is it? at this point. And an but, asteroid. Yeah. But it's still an it's still asteroid number one series, right? Right. And okay. but right. in my view, in this, you know, what if we draw the line at a thousand, which is arbitrary anyway, because these are at the end of the day still yeah. just you know arbitrary nomenclature. Uh, yeah. I would draw the line at a thousand kilometers. So a thousand kilometers would include uh, series as a as a planet, and so mm -hmm. be it. We have okay, we have twenty five planets in the solar system. Fine, you know, yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I don't think I don't see many problems there, uh, except maybe having to reprint some books and things like that, which uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, so we just talked about interstellar. You know, we talked about the the dwarf planets and, and asteroid series. It's a nice kind of roundabout way to bring us onto Oumuamua. And if you yeah. just want to spend like five minutes just telling me like, yeah, how you first heard about that, what your first thoughts were. Um, I know there's lots of people in the community that have different ideas as to what it was. And ultimately, we don't know. But. Yeah, what were your thoughts so, on the whole thing? Uh, you know, the inner solar system where we live uh, has visitors from the outside. But all this time, we had only found or seen visitors that had come from our own solar system, only the outer edges of it. 
So every now and then we might see a rogue asteroid uh, or more commonly a rogue comet. And the comets come from what's usually called the Oort cloud, which is a very diffuse mm -hmm. and fuzzy zone of the outer outer solar system where icy bodies are barely bound to the sun at that point, but nevertheless still bound to the sun. And when these comets through perturbations from other planets get diverted and dive, do a deep dive to the inner solar system, uh, we see a comet come by and light up and sort of start losing uh, gases uh, as it warms up uh, closer to the sun. So that's what makes a comet. Now, again, all of these bodies are coming towards the sun and leaving the sun at velocities that are low enough to tell us that they are bound to the sun. They, they cannot escape the sun. They don't have, uh, they're not on a hyperbolic trajectory. They're just on parabolic, you know, trajectories. Uh, Umuamua was discovered uh, just a few years ago. And it's an object that is on a hyperbolic trajectory. It came in from beyond the solar system. There's no doubt about that at high speeds. And it just did a swing by the sun loosely. Uh, and it's currently on its way out and it hasn't even crossed the orbit of Neptune yet as we speak. So it's still in our solar system. Yeah. Okay. And that thing we know came from outside the solar system and is on its way out. Now, there have been claims uh, that Oumuamua is actually an interstellar spacecraft. Now, uh, you know, Carl Sagan once said, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So the only evidence that is presented so far is that the motion of this body is a little bit irregular. And it seems like there are some things that are nudging it uh, you know, as if there was some thruster on board, uh, you know, diverting it from being strictly gravitational. First of all, that's disputed, and it's it's unclear that that is the case that it has anything that's a propulsion system on board. <laughs> Needless to say, mm -hmm. but but that even that it's being diverted off course by any, you know, thing that we cannot explain. And second, uh, even if it was experiencing some diversion or some, some motion that's not entirely uh, simply a gravitational sort of fly through of the solar system, but, but somehow, for example, if it was emitting gases naturally and it was nudging it sideways, uh, you know, that still doesn't establish it as an alien spacecraft because again, you, you make an extraordinary claim, you need extraordinary evidence. There's no extraordinary evidence here. Uh, so I think that it's, it's part of our lore and, and desirement or desires to, to imagine that this could be a, an, an intelligent spacecraft visiting us. But uh, I think the chances of that being the case are, are sort of zilch. And uh, it is nevertheless really intriguing, okay? Because here's why I find Oumuamua fascinating. I mean, aside from the fact that it's the first example that we've detected of an object that is not of our solar system. Uh, mm -hmm. What's, what's fascinating to me is that, well, where did it come from then? It's, it's part, it's some fragment of some other world. Uh, if it's more of an asteroid than a comet, is it some fragment of some other world from some other solar system that somehow exploded or experienced some major collision and it, it left its star? I mean, the whole, the whole history behind Oumuamua could be really fascinating. What, what has it mm. seen? You know, uh, what yeah. has it seen? And then the other thing is, is how old is it? Because all these things that are comets and asteroids that date back to the beginning of our solar system are capped at about four and a half billion years in age. That's how we know the age of our own solar system. That's how we, we know the age of the sun. Uh, it's from the age of meteorites, the maximum age of meteorites. They all, they all level off at four and a half billion years. That's the age of our solar system. This thing from another solar system could be much more ancient. I mean, our own galaxy is about, you know, uh, maybe 13 billion years in age at this point. This thing could be 10 billion years old uh, mm -hmm. or, or from a solar system that was born much more recently. It could be 2 billion years old. We don't know. And 
you know, it's, it's not of our solar system. So it's really fascinating to, to sort of ponder what, what it could be. And there are thoughts to try to catch up with it before it leaves the solar system entirely, yeah. you know, to go check it out. But of course, it's still on a fast track and it'd be very difficult to match a speed like that to, to catch up with it and sort of in any reasonable amount of time. Um, yeah. The other thing is that since Umamua, we found another one, uh, this time a real comet. So a, a block of ice, basically, mostly. And mm-hmm. it's also interstellar. It was discovered by uh, a Ukrainian amateur astronomer, uh, uh, and it's called Comet Borisov. So Borisov uh, came in as well on a hyperbolic trajectory, therefore is from beyond the solar system, not from the Oort cloud, uh, you know, looped around the sun, and is now on its way out of the solar system as well. And in the process, at some point, broke up into apparently two pieces at least. Okay. I even did a little cartoon yeah. where I said jokingly that after it flew by the Earth, it heard it heard about the social distancing thing. So, so the spacecraft split up in two. Spacecraft uh, split up in yeah. two, uh, <laughs> two because they took it literally. But uh, anyway, I'm just uh, that's just a side note. Uh, it's really fascinating that now that we have the the enough people looking at the deep sky and enough means to track things through time that we, we are starting to discover uh, interstellar objects. And so, mm. so I would anticipate that, you know, every few years we might be finding more and more of these uh, over time. Yeah. And that, that's really, But catch them catch earlier, them earlier. And be able to study them as they yeah. pass us, I guess. Ideally, yeah. um, we could well, catch one that's early enough that we could somehow fly something to encounter it. Um, it would be mm, very difficult. That but, would be, um, yeah. Yeah, that would be, that'd be something maybe in the future. Um, but yeah, talking of interstellar objects and tracking things and watching things again, we did touch on it, the James Webb, but can we just touch on that again? And, and you just tell me again, what, what you know about it? I'm guessing you're excited about it. Um, no, I, the James Webb I, telescope is, is a very exciting, uh, development. I mean, what, what's a development is it's launch, right? Because it's been in the works for over mm-hmm. a decade. Uh, and you know, of course it, it has had its, its, uh, you know, tribulations, it's over budget, it's, it's behind schedule, sure. But it's still uh, going to be such a leap forward for, for science and, and our understanding of the rest of the universe. Uh, so the thing that's really unique about the James Webb Telescope, from my perspective at least, is that it's going to be looking at deep space, just like Hubble did, but in the infrared, with focus on the infrared. And the infrared will allow it to, to see, in some cases, much farther than Hubble was able to. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we will be understanding a lot more about the early stages and the early things uh, about space. I mean, bear in mind, of course, that everything we see in space is, is seen with a time delay. But of course, the, the yeah. farther the, the object is, the more distant in, in our past it is. Uh, and so, so James Webb Telescope is... It's not just a space imaging machine. It's it's a it's a time machine in that sense. It will take us even farther mm. back in time uh, than than uh, than even the Hubble Space, space Telescope uh, could. But the other thing that's that's uh, that's exciting me about it is that it has enough spatial resolution that it will start really seeing uh, planets around other stars. I mean, right now, the way we detect planets around other stars is mostly by the fact that we look at the brightness of the star. And if there's a little bit of dimming, uh, and if it repeats itself, we can conclude that there's a planet that sort of passed right in front of the star from our perspective. Okay. Now, we understand that most stars are not, most star systems out there are not seen edge on. So even though they might have planets, none of them will ever even pass in front of the star. But knowing the statistics or the odds of how many we should be seeing edge on, it seems like most stars that we're seeing edge on will actually have planets. That's good news. Uh, but we still can't really see the planet itself. We just see a bit of dimming of that star. Here, James Webb Telescope yeah. will be able to, to sort of resolve uh, some of these planets and tell us what their atmosphere or surface is made of. And the one thing that it will be able to do is tell us whether or not an atmosphere of a planet has oxygen. Okay. Now oxygen is 
is very reactive, right? We all, you know, it oxidizes things. It's, it's, a, it's a chemical that is, that's very reactive and aggressive. And so you cannot have oxygen in an atmosphere of a planet unless it's actively produced. Because if you just stop producing it and let it sit, it's not going to stay there. It's going to react with the rocks. It's going to oxidize the rocks. So this is why Mars is so red. And it's because it's, you know, whatever oxygen was in its atmosphere uh, has been reacting with the rocks to, to rust them. And now the oxygen is locked up in, in, the, in the rocky surface. But if you have an atmosphere made of oxygen, then something has to be actively producing it. And nothing in nature produces oxygen actively except life. Nothing on earth, at least. Uh, no volcanoes spew out oxygen. It's, 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 if you have oxygen buildup, that's a sure sign that there is life. So if we can, so, so James Webb Telescope is a life detection machine as well for, for life around other stars. And it's going to tell us about places that might, might have you know, an abundance of life or just maybe a little bit of life. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It could pick up if there's oceans as well. Am it I could right pick about up that, if or? there's oceans, uh, you would be looking for water, water signatures. And of course it's going to be, yeah. it's it, the, the telescope is positioned beyond the earth, like, you know, well beyond the earth. So there's no risk of interference from water from the earth's mm. atmosphere, for example. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, there is, it's a wild development, isn't it? To think that it's going to be able to see so far and be able to give us so much detail about, like we say, planets and their environments. Um, yeah, it could change the game. It's going to be uh, super yep. exciting. To when when are we expecting to get like first, um, you know, images or results and things uh, like that? I, from, I don't actually know? know when exactly we will have uh, images. I mean, I would expect there's a commissioning phase of any telescope, which is a phase during which you sort of turn on the instruments, test them. Uh, they're not necessarily looking at the sky immediately. They're looking at themselves, looking at their temperatures. Uh, so, so it's, it's going to be a, a shades of gray type of thing, but I would expect within, mm. um, you know, a few weeks to, to a couple months, we will start having images. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's going to be very exciting. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, look, we, we've been quite a while so far, Pascal. I know we're, I, I'm going to let you get going soon. Um, just to kind of bring us to a close though, I've got a little thing that I uh, kind of planned out. Um, just, uh, I've written down a few quotes, um, by the head of NASA, Bill yep. Nelson on a couple of different topics. And I thought we'll basically play a game. Bill Nelson said, okay. um, and you can react to either what he's saying what he's talking about or just whatever you want to say sure. about it. But I just thought it'd be a fun little sure. way to, to end things. Um, so the first but, couple but, are kind of on but, ET. But these are things that he actually said, is that correct? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Three of them. I, I watched the clip and heard him with my right. own, with my own ears. The third one is a, an article, but it's very clearly as, yep. as if he's, he's quoted very yep. specifically and it's quite similar to the others. Um, so yeah, the first one, is on kind of ET life and it's in terms of if he's working at NASA. So if we get, if, and again, this is a quote, if we get any kind of message of intelligent life, I would suggest our scientists to try to make contact with it. Yep. Um, so first of all, like what would you do, I guess, if you picked up a message of intelligent life and it was your call? And secondly, like, uh, yeah, I mean, is he on the right track there? Is that, are we jumping the gun a yeah. bit by making contact I mean, straight away? Uh, you know, personally, I don't, I I have separate talks on YouTube, so people can catch up with those if, if they're interested. But I actually think that we are uh, we're likely to be alone in our own galaxy as the intelligent civilization mm -hmm. of the time, and it's a it's a longer discussion, of course. But we don't live, yeah. I think, in a Star Trek, you know, Star Warsian galaxy where you know there's civilizations left and right that can all hang out in a bar and and exchange tentacles. I, I think that we we are you know, intelligent life. And the main reason is because intelligent life took so long to appear on earth uh, in contrast to life itself, which started very early in the earth's history. So I think there's plenty of life in the galaxy, including in our own solar system, possibly, but intelligent life. And by intelligent, we mean a civilization that's capable of, of uh, creating radio telescopes, means to communicate with others that came super late. And it wasn't even obvious it would ever happen. Uh, so uh, if you do the numbers, which you can with the Drake equation, uh, you come up with N equals about one. So we might be it in our galaxy. And 
that makes us very that makes it very lonely in our own galaxy. But if there's on average one civilization per galaxy, then with 100 billion galaxies in the universe, we, we're still in good company. Uh, with okay, yeah. all right. So back to Bill Nelson's quote. Uh, I'd be very surprised, first of all, if we had an ET uh, contact, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, and if we did have one, I think it would be from outside our galaxy. Uh, but let's say for the sake of this discussion that it's from inside our galaxy, uh, we could respond and should, but it's a bit hopeless in the sense that uh, we should, first of all, analyze what, we've, what we're hearing and really try to get to what the intent of the message is. Uh, mm. And then of course, formulate a possible response, which could be not responding at all, <laughs> depending on what we think they're saying. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we're receiving video and they're showing, you know, how they're, they are invading other planets and wiping out life, it might serve us to lay low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's fair. Uh, so the next one, um, what can I say? Oh, who am I to say that planet Earth is the only location of a life form that is civilized and organized like ours? So you've made it clear that in your opinion, you don't think there's maybe any more than just us in our galaxy, maybe one other, but probably you think just us. But do you think there's potentially other or like like us in the sense civilized and organized in other galaxies? Yeah. I th- and I, I, by the way, I, I try to not make it an opinion. I try to make it something that I derive quantitatively from from the Drake equation and just just by look by analyzing the what the, the few data the little data that we do have and when mm. when life on earth is the only example of that we have when we use that that's that's a data point it's limited but uh, if you are sort of rigorous about it and don't speculate you know in favor or in disfavor of the thought that there could be other civilizations but you're just using the data that's on hand the numbers turn out to be not very good they, they, they basically mm-hmm. one civilization per galaxy approximately. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so I, I, it's not being closed minded about it. I think it's just being, you know, it's, it, it's still telling you that life and civilizations are the result of evolution, natural processes. It's just that it's a rare outcome and it's okay. Mm-hmm. It, 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 you know, I mean, the message for us, of course, is that, well, you know, nobody's going to come and save us. We have to be really responsible for ourselves and our own future. Uh, also, it means that, uh, you know, we could be it for our galaxy. And so we should still be listening out there, uh, but we shouldn't be expecting, uh, you know, a huge amount of response. Uh, and meanwhile, our search for extraterrestrial civilization should focus on other galaxies uh, as opposed to, you know, just listening to nearby stars. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. Based on that, then I think your your answer to these should be quite interesting. So these ones, Bill Nelson was talking about the recent like Navy videos, the UFO oh, yeah, okay. and things like that. So he said, "I hope it's not one of our enemies, because if it is, they've got a serious advance on us in technology." Yeah, that's interesting. And so yeah, uh, yeah. Do you want me to read the other one now, and you can kind of react to both? It's it's yeah. quite similar. Um, so he said that one. And then he said, they don't know what it is. He's talking about the Navy pilots. They don't know what it is. And we don't know what it is. We hope it's not an adversary here on earth that has that kind of technology, but it's something. And that was what he said. And so I want to know, yeah, your thoughts on what he said and your thoughts on what it is. Cause I do happen to agree with him that it's something I think. That's yeah. I mean, I, I'm in agreement doubt. with every one of these statements by, by Bill Nelson, actually, uh, you know, uh, uh we don't know what UFOs are. I mean, the key word in UFO is the U, uh, the unidentified. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to that extent, uh, we don't know what we're dealing with. And so if, yeah, if it's, if it's the enemy that has that kind of technological capability to, to elude detection and tracking and is instantaneous tech, acceleration, etc., then, then, you know, we're, we, we should worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if not, yeah have you like looked at have you looked into them much and have you have you come to any kind of speculation like do you think it's terrestrial tech do you think it's malfunctions and and deceit or do you think it's weather or you know have you got your own personal so, kind of again it wouldn't I, be uh knowledge yeah, but your I, own I, I go thought. back once again to to this uh to this fact that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence 
But what I'm asking you though is not actually it's not about a claim. I just mean like I, not I'm not saying oh I think they're this. Do you think they're that? I just mean just without any evidence on any side. Um, oh, without without any evidence feeling? on any have side. I, from just the evidence that yeah, we've got, I, I guess, from just I, the evidence that we got. So the videos, the witness testimony, yeah. that kind of thing. With, with, with the so-called evidence that we have so far, I don't think we can conclude. And so my, my position on this would be to, to be open about it, to, you know, to consider multiple hypotheses. But I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, bothered by the fact that we don't have an answer to something. I mean, you, you face that yeah. all day long in science. Uh, you just have to have a real method to approach it. And if we don't have the answer to what mm -hmm. these things are yet, sure, that, that makes them interesting subjects of study. I don't think we should shun UFO research. But on the other hand, we shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that they are aliens, right? And you're not doing that. But what I'm saying is that they, they know, they're no more uh, uh, calling for alien spaceships as they are for some natural phenomena we don't understand yet or some terrestrial, you know, a weapon system that we haven't heard about yet. You know, I mean, there could be a number of things that are flying and unidentified. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by virtue, I think, I mean, if you took a, a, a like, a, you know, all the UFO sightings, even the most hardcore UFO believer or alien believer, whatever, is going to say that 90% of them, 85 to 90 percent of them are yeah aircraft are secret technology from government's black projects are weather birds bags yeah, it could be a combination of these and there's gonna yeah be... it could be a combination of these and then mm. the the question is you know how how many of those that are not uh are still you know might be alien intelligence somehow visiting us um mm. you know i work at the SETI institute i think one should be really open if one is serious about the possibility of alien intelligence out there one should really be open to the possibility mm. that they could have the technology to travel through space and time you know in ways that are beyond our comprehension alien uh, to and us. alien to us and, and come visit us i don't have an issue with that mm. it, it does make it very mm. difficult uh for us to to assert their existence especially if they're trying to elude us. In other words, they don't want to be visible yeah. to us, which is not something yeah. we wouldn't do. Uh, you know, we do that all the time. We try to be not visible to others. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm totally open to it, but it's going to take, again, extraordinary evidence, like a crash, uh, something that mm. you can recover to, uh, to turn that into uh, real proof. Yeah. yeah. No, I see where you're coming from. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're open to yeah. it at least. And it seems like you're kind of general, I guess, open to it and you you believe it warrants further oh, yeah. research, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's fair yeah. to say, yeah? Because um, they are doing that right now. I think you, you're probably aware of uh, Avi Loeb. Yeah, Avi Loeb. Um, who he's involved with the, is, the Galileo yeah. project. Avi is, is claiming that Umamua might be interstellar, uh, interstellar mm. spacecraft. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not convinced yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. The idea that I heard on that and the only one that I can kind of... You know, I think it's interesting to think about at least and speculate about is that I can't picture it being like a Star Wars spacecraft, but potentially some kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just like a a thing sent into here just to observe and just to a take probe. readings. And maybe it's a just a probe. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Potentially sent out from who knows where, how far away, but going through all sorts of different, it might not have been sent here specifically. The fact it's come across us could be coincidence. Maybe it's even from a, you know, a, a different galaxy, like you say. Um, and it's, and it's gone through different solar systems, just tracking, you know, an advanced version of our, of our James Webb. Yeah. And you know, this um, would be, you never this know. would be the, the, almost the, the most intriguing, this is in the category of the most intriguing scenarios that, they, that cannot be ruled out. So to that extent, they, they should be part of the mix. But, uh, mm. you know, again, the, the extraordinary claim has a high bar of, of proof or, or even likelihood, right? And so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I would love yeah. it to be a spaceship. I, I mean, I even have on the internet floating around some, some comparison in size between this thing and, and USS Intrepid in New York Harbor, uh, you know, the, it's like an aircraft carrier that thing uh yeah you know and it has a weird shape uh it's sort of pretty long elongated which is a bit unusual even for an asteroid um mm -hmm. but uh you know i'm okay with saying i have no idea what that is i'm okay with that yeah i, I don't feel the urge yeah. to to jump to some extraterrestrial interpretation uh yet no yet. no yeah. 
no but but we can leave it on the table even if it's in the corner yeah, of the yeah, table we'll leave it there absolutely. just uh, yeah we'll keep it open keep all options on the table awesome well look just to finish off today then um i'm going to ask you if you've got a message you want to pass to anyone watching or listening it doesn't have to be anything particular it can be top five tips for surviving on mars it could be literally anything you want it to be um just if you want to finish yourself with a few words yeah i i would just say just be really open-minded and always think critically uh, about everything i mean even the most established stuff in science, like I'm thinking in planetary science, uh, you know, and things that seem to be entrenched, like thinking that Mars was once Earth-like and had warm oceans and this and that, they, they can, you know, I think they're wrong. Uh, so so there's, there's room for, there's, there's plenty of stuff that we still don't know and understand well. And I think we should really be, even as scientists, especially as scientists, cognizant of that, uh, and, and remain open-minded. But at the same time, we, we, we have to have a brain that acts as a, as a pro, but also as a filter. There's a lot of you know, crap out there that, that is just noise. And in fact, that's the whole art of doing astronomy is to, is to cap, get the signal uh, from the noise, from the background noise. And so uh, it's difficult these days because so many things are brought to, to, yeah. to the fore, to the prom- to a prominent position of being visible, and yet they're not necessarily meaningful, uh, you know. Uh, so, so it's a tough time to think critically. You have to, you know, use good judgment, and, and that's what I try to do. <laughs> that's the message. Yeah, it's it's like you said, it's hard, but that's a good message. That is a good message. That yeah. So stay open minded, but also stay uh, keep critical yeah. thinking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've got to find that balance. That's awesome. Thank you so much for today, uh, Pascal. It was really, Thank really you, ben. fun. Uh, super yeah, interesting. Really we could have talked for eight hours. Like I could, I could have just carried yeah, on sure. going. Um, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and and maybe we'll do it again sometime. But uh, thank you again, and and have a good. Thank one, you man. for the opportunity, and you're you're a good interviewer. You you let me talk. <laughs> That's something I can do. That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very <Yeah>. much. <laughs> Thanks for listening to that conversation with Pascal Lee. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some things along the way. Please check out all the links in the description. And if you're still listening, please subscribe. Be nice, be happy, 